All right, everyone, welcome to the school committee meeting of Thursday, September 28th, 2017. I first want to welcome uh, Marian Nolan, who is the AA's first vice president. She's sitting at the table tonight. Um, and she is a reading specialist and a team leader K through five at the Bishop Elementary School. Thank you for being here. And Rob Marchant is here. He is a sophomore at Arlington High School. I got that right? Yep. All right, welcome. Feel free to join in any time you want. Um, okay, we're going to begin uh, tonight with um, open meeting. Why are we doing that? We're going to begin with you, Ruthie, right? <laughs> we're going to begin with Ruthie. Great. We're going to open the meeting. Uh, the meeting is open. Ruthie is here uh, to give uh, a report on our facilities, so uh, I'm going to let you go to it. Go ahead. Great. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to show you what we've been doing in the facilities department. This is a presentation, but I'm happy to have questions in the middle or a dialogue, so you know, feel free to, to raise your hand if you've got a question. Um, this is the staffing of the facilities department. A little bit about myself. I'm an architect. Uh, I developed affordable housing for 15 years in California. Uh, and then when I came back home to the East Coast, uh, I was fortunate enough to become Arlington's first energy manager in 2013. Uh, and then when the town created a facilities department, I was fortunate enough again to be the first uh, director of the department. So I've been in Arlington almost five years and it's been very exciting, really great stuff going on. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to show this to you is um, we've had some changes. So for example, this HVAC, two people, we never had an HVAC tech in-house. We always had an external company cost us over $100,000 a year in a contract. Every time they came out, it was 100 bucks to get here, 100 bucks to go home. And we never knew anything more than what they told us when we saw them. There was no data that was stored for us. There was no chronology of what had happened over the years to so the piece of equipment. So we requested um, to add a position of an HVAC tech in-house. We have a great person on board. His name is Kyle. And so now I'd say at least half, if not three quarters of our repairs are done in-house. What's critical is that now Kyle knows all the pieces of equipment on all our roofs and all our boilers, and so he starts to have a history of what he has seen, what, what's been breaking, what's repaired and didn't get fixed. If a third party contractor comes in for a bigger project, he's there to learn what they see is wrong, to learn how to fix it, and also again to chronicle, as I'll show you later, what was done to the pieces of equipment. So we're trying to bring the knowledge in-house, not just have it with a third party that walks away and doesn't tell us anything. Um, the other person that we have, the second HVAC person, um, is a new gentleman named JJ, and he is preventive maintenance. That's all he does, and it's a full-time job, is to do the preventive maintenance uh, on our buildings. We have specifically the HVAC. Uh, we as a town have spent a wonderful amount of money on rebuilding many of our schools, and the key is we want those buildings to last. We want them to be warm when they need to be, cool when they need to be. We want um, right ventilation for the kids in the classrooms, in the gym. So JJ's job is to go through each piece of equipment, and there's a certain um, time per year that he goes through them, and he does the maintenance, but he also, again, he chronicles what he does, what he sees. If he looks at a piece of equipment where he's changing the filter, but he realizes that the belts are wearing out, now we know, right? Now he comes to us and says, we need to fix the belt or we need to repair them. Before, if we did third-party preventive maintenance, you know, no negative judgment on them, but they probably wouldn't tell us when we saw them, you should change this now. They would wait maybe till it broke and then they would call us. So we're really trying to bring internal all the knowledge of our building equipment. Um, one thing I'm also really proud of is the supervisor of maintenance. That's Michael McCarthy. He was actually the town electrician for 11 years. He applied for this position and beat out all the competitors. There were a number from outside. And so I'm really excited that we were able to promote someone from a trade job to being a supervisor. Um, so what we've done in the facilities department is, um, again, trying to chronicle all of our information. So we have three um, modules in a software program from a company called School Dude, which they are as very cool as they sound. Um, so we've got work orders, preventive maintenance, and capital forecast. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but the way that work orders used to work in Arlington is you would call someone's cell phone and they would write what you just said on a post-it note. And then they would put it somewhere and you hope, and they hope, that they remembered it. And if you were really squeaky wheel, you called and you had like 20 post-its for your work order. But nobody knew when you called, what you, what you needed. There was no record of it. So right now, anybody who works in the town or the schools is able to access the software program, the work order program, 
and they can put in a work order. They can all create their own account. It's very simple. Um, and we can see at a glance how many work orders we have that are outstanding, how many we've completed. We can sort it by school. We can sort it by type of equipment. We can sort it by whatever you want to sort it by. So we can start to look back and say, you know, which school is taking the most amount of our, our maintenance guy's time, right? Or which school constantly is moving things from this school to that school 10 times a year? Can we be smarter about that? Because we can look and see what the work orders are. The work orders are for maintenance and custodial. So if you need a particular thing cleaned, if you need something fixed, it all goes through the work order system. Um, so I'm just going to try to walk you through a couple of the important points about the work order. So again, you can every building in the town is listed here. We've made it specific to Arlington. So all of our schools are here, all of our town buildings. Um, it's rec you know the request date. You try to, as much as you can, elicit a, a, res a real detailed description of what people are looking for, what they want us to do. Um, up here, you'll see it says priority. And one of the things you can check, so you can tell them it's low, medium, or high. But what's really important is here, you could check a box that says emergency. And that sends a text to either the supervisor of maintenance or the supervisor of custodians. So if you really have an emergency, like you know, there's water leaking somewhere. It's not like life or death, but we really need you to get over here. It sends them a text right away. All the other work orders come in to their email inboxes, and they send them out, you know, throughout the day. So what we're trying not to have people do is to have 20 people calling us, I have an emergency. If it's not life-threatening, you know, if it's not a serious issue, check that box emergency, and we'll know about it. Um, a couple of other things, it, it, uh, you put in your, your phone number comes up automatically, so if we don't know where you are, we don't understand what you're talking about, or we don't know where to go, we can call you. Um, and down here, what starts to happen is you put in, you get like little pictures to check boxes. Like if it has to do with painting, there's a little paintbrush. If it has to do with HVAC, there's some kind of, you know, air conditioner looking unit. So again, it, it, you don't have to be able to understand exactly what the words mean. Technically, you can choose a picture. But then the system automatically sorts where the work order should go. Is it maintenance? Is it custodial? So automatically happens. We've set that up behind the scenes so that our supervisors are getting the right work orders to, the, to their inboxes. Um, and then, I'm not sure if you could see it here, but you can also attach a picture, which we love. If something is broken or you don't like your desk, or just send us a picture and we'll know exactly what we're looking for. So as much information as can be given to us, we get in the work order. Um, and then we can also respond, right? If, we're, if a part is on order, or we can't get to you, or this wasn't approved by your principal, we can respond in the work order, and then it's all tracked, right? So anybody can go in and look at their work orders and see where their work order is. So it's very easy to communicate with us without having to call and find us. Um, so the next piece of uh, software is preventive maintenance. And what is really wonderful about this is not only have we put in, at this point, over 100, at least, preventive maintenance work orders, but um, whoever the tech is that goes out to do the work order writes inside the work order what they did, what they saw, anything particularly we need to know about next year. Like at the Bishop School, you have to you know, talk to this person first before you go into that room. It's all chronicled in here. And so the system is set up where Michael McCarthy, the supervisor of maintenance, he writes down all the requirements for the preventive maintenance of each piece of equipment. So when you get the work order as a maintenance person, you know exactly what to do. Um, and then a month before the preventive maintenance work order is due, it gets sent to the person. So they know it's upcoming in their work log. You know, if they're taking vacation or they know they have like lots of work and they won't get to it, we can have a dialogue. What's also is here is we do have third party who do some of our preventive maintenance. And this basically goes to the administrative assistant for facilities, and then she schedules the preventive maintenance that should happen. So again, we're tracking everything in the software system. Anybody could go in and say, when's the last time we changed the filters at the you know, bracket school? Well, when are they, you know, they're not due for another two weeks. Well, let's discuss why we think we need to do them earlier. The last piece of the software is capital forecast. And um, what this is basically is every piece of a building, the roof, the windows, the foundation, the, you know, any electrical wiring, any light, any anything, at some point will have to be purchased again, right? That's our 30-year kind of capital plan. So what this does, this is actually a picture uh, of the Thompson School, which is our most recent school and has a very long forecast. But we've put in probably about 75% of the pieces of the building of the Thompson. And this system, the software, it asks for you know, what region of the country we live in. And it has an automatic inflation factor. And then it says, based on what that piece of equipment is and when we installed it, 
when we'll need to replace it, and how much it will cost. So to me, this is like, this is going to be great. When this is totally filled in, it'll be great. Um, and so one of my challenges was, when are we going to get the time to fill in all the information about all of our buildings? So one thing that this uh, software has is a spreadsheet. It has um, about 20 different uh, columns that you fill in about each piece of equipment. Serial no number, model number, warranty date, who installed it, when they installed it, everything you want to know and don't want to know about a piece of equipment or a piece of the building. So what you can do is you can fill out this spreadsheet and then you can upload it into School Dude. So I could put down 20 pieces of equipment, answer you know, 10 to 20 questions on each one, and then it becomes in the capital forecast. It tells me 20 years, 30 years, how much it's going to cost when you need to replace it. So we tried this concept on the Stratton project. GNR was the contractor, and I said, you know, will you be my guinea pig, and will you fill in four pieces of HVAC equipment, these 20 questions? And so they were very generous, and they said, sure, no problem, we'll fill it in. So they filled it in. Uh, I sent it to School Dude. They uploaded it. And lo and behold, now the Stratton starts to have a 30, a 20, 30, 40 year capital outlook. Um, so the coolest thing that we're doing now is on the Gibbs project with Shawmut Construction, it's in the specifications that all the subcontractors who are installing something that we would have to replace at some point, now they get that spreadsheet as part of the bid package, and they know they have to fill that in. So on the Gibbs, I don't have to go back and type in anything. It'll all be in there automatically, right? So any project we do, even the addition to the Thompson, there's a unit on the roof, that also got put into the spreadsheet. So again, not only are we chronicling the data, but we're making, you know, we're doing it in a smarter way. We're not having folks like we were doing on the Thompson sitting down and typing everything in. So very user friendly and, you know, gives us a very easy to read graph and you can slice it by roof, you can slice it by foundation, you know, you can see whatever you want to see in terms of what our costs are going to be in the future. Um, but I have to say that we're, we're not, you know, the Thompson is the only one we've really put in yet. We're, we need a little more time to get the other, the other schools in. But for the high school, this will be clearly what we're going to do, right? I mean, from the very beginning, we will be smart about how we chronicle everything we're going to do to the high school. Um, one of the last things I wanted to talk about was our schedule. So again, it used to be come June or even July, some of the principals would call and say, could you do this this summer? And I'm like, this summer's already like started and almost gone, you know? Um, so I tried to work with all the principals to figure out a schedule. You know, we meet in October. I tell them to think about their summer projects in November. They start in Thanksgiving. They come back to me after New Year's. We talk about what they want. I meet with Dr. Bodie. And by February, we figured out what we're going to do this summer, either from our internal funds. We've already submitted to capital, but this is our own internal projects. And so we can start allocating our staff. How many guys are we going to need? When can they go into each building? We have camps in some buildings, so you have to wait till the end of the summer. So the principals know what they're going to get. They're you know, ready for it. We commit to do it. And um, it, it's, it's a much better flow in terms of the expectations that are being met, but also we tell them what we can and can't do. Right? So some schools, like the Odyssey, you know, need and want lots of changes. And we can only do you know, so much per summer, particularly if they have a summer camp. So they know that in February. They're not surprised in July when I say, how could I possibly do that now? You know, I've got all this other work. So it, I'm trying to have everybody um, give me their expectations up front so we could tell them what we can meet and then there's less frustration. Um, the last thing I want to share with you, which is, this is like in the super cool world. Um, so, so one thing I'm trying to do as we move forward with our projects is to put Arlington on a, a higher level of sophistication for our design, for our construction, for our data coming in. In, in the latest project at the Gibbs, we're working with Shawmut Construction. And what, they, what they've bought, actually, is this camera. It's a Matterport camera. And it does scanning. It has like an infrared light. And it scans 360 degrees in a building. And it can see, um, it, it can basically, it's hard to, well, we'll see a video. But basically, the camera can tell you what's exactly <coughs> in the building. Once you demolish the walls, it can tell you what's really there. So on the Gibbs, we had some old drawings. We went in there and did some measurements, but we didn't take down any ceilings because it was an occupied building. So we have what's called a Revit model. That's a model where we, the architects drew what they measured and what they thought they saw. But the Matterport camera actually scans and measures what's really there, where the roof beams really are. And then it can take the scan, and you'll see this happen, and put it over the Revit model. And you'll see pictures of this where we can see what we thought was there from our measurements and our pictures to what's really there, because it's scanning and able to actually measure from a laser. 
So we never knew about this. Shamit brought it to us. They're doing it on the Gibbs, and you'll actually see a picture of something that we didn't know about the Gibbs that we learned when we, when we did this. So you wanna, we're going to show a, a video. This is a video of the Gibbs, of some of the pictures, um, um, some of the scanning they did at the Gibbs. It's a little bit hard to hear, so, but he's, he's basically walking us through what you're seeing. Make it full screen. This is really the Gibbs right now. Get dizzy. <laughs> That's the old theater. We just go back to a couple of other. Um, <coughs> I just want to show you what they showed us the value right now in using the camera. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see it, but basically it's a, a scan and model integration. So the thin lines here are the Revit model that the architects draw, but the thicker lines like this are what's really existing in the building. So you can see where you thought there was a column, but actually the column was two inches to the right which is critical when you're trying to get beams, you know, or mm -hmm. HVAC equipment. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. This actually happened where we couldn't see in the ceiling, we couldn't see through the roof, and... I'm aware of the uh, Yeah, we can, we can... Yeah, just get out of that. Yeah. So basically, right here, this is actually the truss of the roof. But this is what we thought it was because we couldn't see through when we were trying to measure the ceiling. So this is a very simple angle. This is 45 and 45, but this is not. That's critical to, if we're going to try to put ducts through the ceiling. Mm -hmm. So um, 
and what's great is that we were sort of sophisticated enough to, to get it from Shawmut and to understand the value. Um, again, it's a little bit hard to read, but again, al alignment modeling, right? Floor joists, roof joists, all that kind of stuff that when you open it up and you had ducts going one way and then it can't go there anymore, now it's a change order from the sheet metal guy because he has to change the size and the location and more money is spent. So um, this kind of thing is really valuable. And then you can incorporate all the tags and the measurements that you want. And then you can save this drawing. So once this building is completely built out, I'll be able to say, well, I know that the ducks are running here because this is where they were when we built it. So it's valuable now in terms of knowing what, where things are in an existing building. It's valuable for the future when someone says, where is that plumbing pipe? You know, should we just like try to open up the wall and find it? No, I know exactly where it is. Um, the other thing we're doing on, on our construction projects is we get uh, a hard set of blueprints, but we also get all the drawings in an e-file, and we keep them on the facilities server, which everybody, you know, we can um, look at all the drawings on the server. A, we don't have to worry about losing the drawings, but B, we can um, easily find what we're looking for in a, in a construction project. Instead of calling someone, they send you a PDF. It's not the right part of the drawing. It's all, you know, so. Um, Again, just trying to get as much information as we can in a sophisticated way and be able to utilize it. Anybody, right? The electrician, the plumber, the supervisor of maintenance, even the custodians, right? They can certainly look at some of these drawings and help us understand where they think the problem is. Um, so that's, that's basically what we're doing in facilities. We're really excited. Uh, we appreciate all the support that we've gotten from the schools. Dr. Bodhi has been great working through a lot of issues with us, but I feel like uh, Arlington has really moved leaps and bounds, you know, since I started a couple of years ago. So uh, thank you, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, wait, yeah. Comment, sure. And I'll take questions. I, I want to compliment uh, uh, Ruthie Bennett because um, our schools have never been in as good a shape as they can be as they are now. And it's very complicated as our schools get used more and more. In fact, this summer was an all-time high usage, mm -hmm. and yet they still were able to complete the projects that we set out in February, March, mm -hmm. and get the cleaning done, the deep cleaning. So it has really made a huge difference to have her in this leadership role and to have this level of organization. It was, you know, I'm not saying there wasn't the transition time as people got used to this software program, and uh, getting used to the schedule in which we need to plan, but it's getting better and better all the time. So I want to you know, publicly thank you and your department for the yeah. great work you're doing for us. Yeah, it's been great, thank you. I too want to echo that. Uh, I mean, I, I have the privilege of working with Ruthie also on the Town Building Committee, and uh, she, she's 110%, and Arlington is just super benef benefited from her experience and her work ethic and a uh, little bit I've seen uh, she's inspired her people with it too so thank you yeah you're welcome I, I have a great staff I really it, it, they are excellent Tracy. so this is fascinating um, to take it all the way to where I'm hoping it'll go I would imagine that this will mean we will save money down the road um, because we won't have emergencies you know there's not going to be the emergency elevator repair well, we can do it <laughs> <laughs> or, or at least not as many. Right, right. Um. So, no, that, that's, a really, um, that's a really good comment. So I would say, first off, having the HVAC person in-house and the preventive maintenance person in-house takes down the emergency factor by, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent, because we are looking at our own equipment all the time. And he's changing a filter, but he's also looking at the belt and the actuator. And so instead of someone, a third party, coming in, doing one thing and leaving, we have someone looking at everything. So that's definitely... Um, that's definitely true in terms of saving money. I think also part of it is I'm, I'm trying to create a different culture for us of not reactive, but proactive, right? Let's prevent, let's think about, so as, as you all know, we had an issue with the rooftop unit at the Audison. So after we realized that this one was not coming back, we looked at the other ones, right? And I talked to Dr. Bodie about, well, what should we say to capital? When will we need a new one, right? And how can we stagger it? And, and again, just trying to think more about if that one's going and its neighbor is similar age and similar usage, yep. it's on its way out. Yeah. Um, but the preventive maintenance will help them last longer. Part of what happens, this is like a minute detail, but if you don't change the filter, it gets clogged. Mm -hmm. The motor starts working harder and harder. Mm -hmm. It wears itself out. 
And we have this at the Stratton right now in the unit ventilators in the classrooms, where the motors were working really, really hard, and all of a sudden, like one at a time, they started to die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of that issue is working with the teachers to understand how unit ventilators work. Like on-off is not what they like to do. Mm -hmm. But also some of it is us getting in there and looking at the inner workings on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely, the point is to save money but to be proactive so that we don't have yeah. these emergencies. That's good. Although I will say elevators are the worst. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, especially one elevator. Um, <laughs> the other question, so the model, the manor, manor whatever port. it was, that only works if you take all the ceilings and walls off, right? It's not doing x-ray. I'm, I'm, I'm serious a little bit. I, I mean, yeah. it could be done with x-rays, right, to measure, but it, it's not doing that, right? Correct, okay. right. So what it's doing for us is it's taking a Revit model, which is the way the architects basically design now. They create this wireframe model from old drawings and from their measurements. Mm -hmm. And it says, here's what's really here. And you put them together in the software program and automatically it lines them up. So the value to us is, as you saw, where is that roof truss really landing? Mm -hmm. It's not landing over here. It's actually landing you know, two and a half feet away. That's critical. So yeah, it's not, it's not x-raying, okay. but it is helping us understand the difference between what we saw, what we measured, mm -hmm. and what's really there. And then again, for posterity, we will know at where everything is before we close it up right. in a 360 degree you know, view. I mean, it's yeah. great. It's Thank cool. you. Yeah. Paul, uh, th th this is stunning. I, I'm, I'm just really fascinated, especially by the camera. Uh, the, it, it, you know, having lived through the Odyssey rebuild where they were discovering all sorts of wacky stuff in the process, uh, it, w it would have been an absolute joy to have something like this yeah. back, back in the day when we did that. Um, and fortunately, most of our buildings are new enough that uh, you know, you, you can project out a long way for the critical stuff. Uh, and, and I'm really thrilled to hear that you've incorporated uh, the uh, construction folks to get it into school, dude, yeah. so that we, we have the baseline to go for. So this is, this is all magnificent. I, I'm very impressed. And, <laughs> you know, as an old-time school committee member, it's not often you really learn something new and cool at a school committee meeting, but this is one of them. So my question for you is totally off topic, un uh, unrelated. We've got this building here that we're so sort of keeping patched together to the extent we can with the knowledge that uh, uh, it it's going to be a new, wonderful facility in a couple of years. Uh, can you sort of comment on how we're making it through to the demise, the final demise of, uh, of this thing, and how much are we spending on duct tape? Uh, well, <laughs> um, hmm. you know, how are we making it through? We are prioritizing, mm -hmm. right? So clearly, uh, thermal comfort, student, staff comfort is critical, and we fix. Mm -hmm. and, uh, right now, we're spending money on the boiler in the uh, mechanical B boiler room uh, because we need to. Um, uh, we are not, we're trying not to do any kind of large change of spaces. Even though we still have new staff coming into the high school, we're trying not to spend a lot of money on creating, you know, new offices. We're trying to do it as simply as we can. Mm -hmm. um, we are doing more preventive maintenance. So we had an issue with the Red Gym where, you know, on X number of degree day, mm -hmm. thing just stopped bringing in fresh air. Mm -hmm. and so. We said, you know, we've only got like whatever, let's say two or three more years in this building. We're not going to buy a new one. Mm -hmm. But we need to get in there and figure out what, can, what of the guts can we take out of that piece mm -hmm. and buy new guts. And, you know, that's cheaper than taking it all out and putting in a new one. Mm -hmm. So trying to understand each issue at that time and figuring out what can we do to save this piece of equipment for two or three more years or... Mm -hmm. You know, do we need to buy a new one? And if we buy a new one, can we save that new one, mm -hmm. right? We, we put the solar panels on. In the agreement, we, we said clearly, we're going to take them off at some point, store them over here, and then we're going to put them back. So mm -hmm. trying to do both. Very impressive. I'm, I'm, this is great. I know. Isn't it cool? Yeah, it's really cool. I, I can just think of how much fun to be play with this. You know? yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I want to echo as well how impressed I am. What, um, Four years ago when I ran for school committee, I heard from many, many people that Arlington put up all these new buildings but then didn't maintain them. And that was a common criticism and everyone was like, yeah, that's sort of right. And that's no longer true. And it's really exciting, just the whole effort. I mean, the tools are cool, but the whole effort um, and the foresight is, is really amazing. Um, I have actually a question, um, and it could also be for Dr. Bodhi, about um, what happens at the school level. So 
who has the authority to make the requests? I assume then it goes to the principal first. You know, do all teachers have the have the authority to make so, a request? Right. Or? That's a good question. Um, uh, so, so I meet with the principals. Mm -hmm. They know. We talked about the schedule. They know when it's coming. Most of their requests are related to what a teacher might need, or a new classroom layout, or a new classroom coming in of children that we didn't have the year before. So. Um, I try to keep it at the principal level. They mm -hmm. gather their ideas. And then also I talk to them about what all of them are requesting, right? Mm -hmm. Like you asked for 15 things and your neighbor asked for two. So, you know, so, um, but we do talk about the money. We do talk about our resources. What can we, you know, mm -hmm. realistically get done in two months when, as we saw, there's lots of summer camp taking up lots of time. And, you know, a lot of my staff take vacation. So I'm not fully staffed for eight months. So. But we really keep it at the principal level. So, so usually level. Mm -hmm. the principal is making these requests. Yes. And then yes. E even, and then and sort of another sort of detailed question. Um, previously, the principal would sort of walkie-talkie the custodian to fix right. like a clogged toilet or something. Does that now go through the system, or does that those type of things still go through? Right. So if it's something the custodian can do, clogged toilet. Right. It depends right. on how challenging. Right. But like if there's a milk spill, you, you know, you don't have to put it in school. Do we need to get that right, right away? It's more of. Um, if this is something that's a piece of equipment related, okay. right? This is gonna break, this is breaking, or mm -hmm. it's broken, there's no heat in this room. Um, they do it through school dude. And what I've tried to reinforce is the more you put it in school dude, the more I can say, you know, the Odyssey keeps having HVAC issues in this wing. I know that because I can pull it out of the school mm -hmm. dude. If you keep calling me, I'm not gonna remember. So I'm trying to help that reinforce sure. it for them. And then I have one more logistical question. Um, so at the school-based level, are principals making requests both about the buildings and about the playground structures or the outside as well? Is that, that's all happening? Right, so most of their um, requests are like interior classroom location and um, sometimes playground. We try to come forward with playground. So the capital, uh, the five-year plan has um, um, spots for the playground upgrades and we actually um, I'm working with the Department of um, Public Works and the director of the Park and Rec the three of us are working together now to talk about all the playgrounds in town because there's one pot of money so you know let's just make sure we get all the playgrounds fixed so it's a back and forth the principals usually come with I need this change to this classroom I come back to them with this is what else we're doing to your building because your door is not closing or your you know so it's um, if they know about it and, and it's a project on the exterior they'll come to us more often than not, we're already aware of it. Okay. So. Great. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> we have to move to public. Anybody else? We got to move to public particip participation. Ruthie, thanks so much. Good luck at your next meeting. I know you have another one right now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone here for public participation? Anyone sign up, Karen? No. Oh, nobody did. All right. This is a hand up. Oh, you are. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on up. Yeah, you're the yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, no, no problem. Yeah, okay. Just make sure you give, oh, sorry. No, you uh, just. Give your name at some Give your name. Yeah. All right. And then you gotta speak into the mic, sorry to, yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, my name's Erin Whalen, and I had emailed you, some of you, I'm from the Pierce School, and I have a kindergartner there. And um, I have a parent, petition that our school had circulated um, and we'd emailed or I had emailed you and some other parents as well about the fact that we don't have full-time kindergarten aides this year and I don't know if everyone got any responses or anything um, and so I just wanted to bring it to the school committee tonight as an issue of importance to myself as an individual other parents at our school uh, the teachers at our school, and also our administrator. Our principal has paid for full-time aides for this first month of school because she felt it was important. She did it out of discre discretionary budget. And um, for us, it's the first time we have three full kindergartens at our school, and modifications weren't made to the third classroom uh, based on uh, projections for next year. We weren't sure we'd have three, three kindergartens again. So one of them is on the third floor. It doesn't have an included bathroom, doesn't have included cubbies. Um, so the kids are asked to be more independent up there. Um, in talking with our school committee, uh, parents noted that they were very concerned about our large class sizes, um, people's or teachers' ability to instruct and implement IEPs. Um, also, just that our curriculum tools of the mind is designed for small group instruction. And so um, 
We're asking if there's any way to continue with the full-time aides at our school for this year um, as we adjust to having three classes. Um, a lot of people at our school are at our curriculum night, which happens to coincide with this meeting, unfortunately. Um, and so I know other parents wanted to be here, but they're at our school tonight. And as I was listening to the interesting presentation that was just made, um, I thought it was useful to talk about saving money down the road. And so in my discussions with both the administrator and teachers, they talked about early success in kindergarten really leading to continued success for people. And so I just wanted to open that discussion or share my thoughts about it and our community's concern. All right, thank you very much. We've, we've seen the emails. We, we have a rule in pu public participation in that we don't respond. Okay. Um, so we just got it on the record. Okay, um, and then uh, what happens? W at some point during the meeting, someone will probably bring this up. Okay. And it may be referred to a subcommittee or there may be questions of the superintendent during her report in about an hour or whenever that's on the agenda. Okay, thank you. All right, okay, thanks for being here. Anyone else uh, for public participation? All right, thanks so much. Human Rights Commission appointment appointee is not here. OECD test update, Dr. Janger, Mr. McKnight. Hello again, everyone. Um, uh, I was, uh, I had the uh, privilege of presenting to you in the spring um, to tell you about the administration um, of this test um, before we actually had, had the results and we're here to, to share some of the results. Um, so I think we were going to begin just by reviewing so a little, some of those fundamentals. Um, again, the OECD PISA is the test that's administered by the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation Development internationally, and that a test uh, of a similar nate, a very similar design, was became available in the U.S. Um, to provide uh, school-level data that something is not available <coughs> internationally, um, and that we signed on to become part of a consortium. Um, as part of that consortium, we had the the the. We were able to administer the test, which we did in March, um, to a pool of about 70 um, 15 year olds. Um, I wanted to say one thing again about that, per that group of uh, students that it was not um, a cherry picked group of students. There was a a randomly selected group, um, a few students opted out, but we did have students there from um, all ability levels. There were students in that group with IEPs, there were students, uh, ELL students, there were um, st students with some social and emotional uh, learning needs. Um, so it really was a cross, uh, a cross section. Um, and I, after presenting that to you in the spring, I went home and um, tossed and turned, realizing that, of course, students had no incentive in this to do well. They were not going to get their individual results, and there was no carrot or anything like that. And I was like, I w I'm really terrified that they didn't try. Um, when we got, we got our first set of results back in June, um, where the results were, were referenced against uh, 2012 PISA results. We got recently another set of, uh, another report just last <coughs> week where it was uh, referenced against 2015 results. Um, both of these um, reports, um, not only I think we were relieved to see that the students uh, did well, but actually encouraged to see that they did exceptionally well. So the highlight is, is, is that w our students performed exceptionally well in all three areas, reading, math, and science. Not only uh, in, comparison, uh, in comparison to other schools in Massachusetts, to other schools in the country, um, and to other uh, students around the world. Um, and as you will see, um, it's not only that their overall level of performance, but the number of students who are performing at the highest, uh, uh, highest levels in those particular subjects. So the thing that really attracted us 
I mean, we have lots of testing going on, and so more testing is not necessarily something we want to do, but participating in this partnership um, was interesting because in addition to being able to just sort of get levels of achievement um, and the comparative data internationally, um, two major advantages of this test, which Mr. McKnight will talk about in a bit, um, are the, uh, that they look at elements of classroom practice, classroom climate, um, and <coughs> a few interesting results there. And then in addition, we get to collaborate internationally with other groups that are in participating in the PISA test for schools. So th this one's a little bit um, hard to read. It's a little weird because it's actually cut scores. So they looked at quartiles in terms of performance to make this comparison. And if you look, our highest performing quartile has a cut score. That means 25% of our students do better than this of 620 on their test, whereas the mean score is 565. But what's more helpful to really understand, and you can go through the lower quartiles and upper quartiles, but what's particularly helpful to understanding this, um, we didn't get this in the original report, and I'm not sure it went in the report because we sent out the data to you, I believe. Um, but what this is is a comparison by performance level. On the test, there are six levels of performance, and I went to a workshop this summer um, where I was actually somewhat late in the game asked to present. And it was because of this uh, piece of information and one other piece of information. And the six levels of performance, if you look, um, if you wanted to, look, we looked at sort of actually what the kinds of questions are, what kind of reading, what kind of mathematical analysis they're looking at, what kind of scientific analysis they're looking at. There are three similar charts to this. And when you look at the levels of performance, the highest levels, the four, five, and six, the top three bars on that chart, really would line up with what we consider to be honors and AP levels of performance. And what was really surprising was not just that we were in, if you look in Massachusetts, the top three performing schools on reading, for example. Um, if you go down somewhere right in the middle, you can see the scores in Singapore, which often is touted as being one the, the top performing on the PISA in the world. And if you go down to just below the United States, you'll look at Shanghai, which again is touted as being one of the highest performing areas in the United States. But what's most impressive is if you look at the proportion of our students that are performing at the highest levels. And in every single test, we outperformed everybody on the map. Um, and so those are very high levels of performance. They require analytic conversation, not simple reading performance. And you'll look, our average scores, and this is an issue that we should look at. We have that little bar in the middle. The kids to the left of the bar are kids where you're expecting them to get passing but non-proficient or non-passing. We don't really have anybody in the red because red would be not passing the MCAS. We don't have anybody in the end that does that. Um, you know, one a year if we do. Um, and similarly, you'll look here in math. So in math, we were the highest performing school. The ones just below us are Wellesley and Natick. But most impressive, again, is if you look at just the number of students in that top band, it's something like 85% of the students are performing at that level. And then if you look again in science, this one was funny. I was like, wait, we're not in the top three. And then I figured out, because you could figure out by asking everybody that we were number 12, which is the fourth. And although we are not averaging as high as Natick Mystic uh, Valley Charter School, Mystic Valley Charter and Sturgis Charter, both of whom get a little bit of selection on their kids, again, the proportion of our students at that highest level um, is particularly notable. And then the last thing, which was why they called me and asked me to present, was that if you looked at everybody in the chart, and we don't actually have this chart up here, but related, you know, there's always a clear relationship between these scores and socioeconomic status in every country, across every country, and in every school. Um, and if you look at us in that performance, and I think there might be a chart that'll give that example of that, we outperform the regression line. And that was the most notable thing. And I think the thing for which we can be most proud. It's nice to capitalize on our demographic, but most impressively, we do this at these high levels of performance and above the demographics of our students. So now Paul's gonna talk a little bit about some of the breakdown. So again, one of the interesting things about this, um, this test is that not only, uh, there, there's not only a cognitive section, but a lengthy questionnaire. Um, the, and those questions do ask, uh, include questions about um, classroom climate, um, demographics, um, and in this case, reading habits. Um, this was a, a graph that was both encouraging and uh, concerning, uh, or at least interesting, was 
one place where we were really sort of out of, uh, in where the numbers were quite different was to look at um, the, the number of our students who were described themselves, would be described as deep and highly restricted. Now, um, of course, depth here versus surface has to do with uh, a student's ability to understand the level of complexity. So deep readers are good readers and, and can handle chal challenging texts. Wide versus highly restricted is how much students read mm -hmm. or how broadly students read. And w this is not a surprise to us because we frequently hear our students are too busy to read mm -hmm. a lot. So they read what they read in school and they do not, and, and don't always, uh, aren't all, don't always have the time to read broadly. Um, of course, this did not demonstrate any lack of performance on their part, uh, and they still perform very strongly <coughs> as, as good readers. Um, but this, again, this is something that, uh, again, as a member of the English department, um, we have been aware of for a long time and have been encouraging through um, independent reading projects, offering more choice in uh, summer reading, and looking at other, other ways to in increase student engagement and choice in, in what they read. Um, so. Um, other graphs that are available in, in the report talk a little bit about disciplinary climate. So here, again, the, um, the, the diamonds are uh, the United States average and the, and the rectangles are uh, how students describe um, the disciplinary climate in their mathematics uh, classes. So the farther to the right, the, the better. That's the fewer, the percentage of students who say that these things never happen. The, there is almost never or, or rarely uh, noise and disorder in the class, for example. Um, the, the chart for the uh, English classes is actually um, perhaps even more impressive. I'm not just saying that as an English department member, but it's almost all the way over on the right. I think for those of us who work in the high school, this is not a surprise to us. We do feel as though um, that there is a, a, a climate that facilitates learning in, 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 cl in classrooms. And as M Matthew was allu alluding to, um, we also have some data. Now, again, I do not believe that this is available in the first report, which is the one I think that was shared with you, but with the one that just, just arrived to us um, with the 2015, um, where we, here we see um, uh, going from left to right, uh, st students of low uh, socioeconomic status um, to, or to the right hand, st students of high socioeconomic status with the average in the middle. Um, so this suggests that there's a very little uh, a, a achievement gap among our students when it comes to reading, um, and even then that the, the students on the lowest end of that uh, socioeconomic spectrum are still outperforming students at the highest end at, on average of students across the country and in other, other countries. Um, again, where there is a slightly larger uh, achievement gap here in, in mathematics, Again, um, the students of the uh, low socioeconomic status are still um, outperforming um, at, uh, students on average in the United States and even students on average at the highest socioeconomic levels, as well as Finland and, uh, Finland and uh, Singapore. And again, th those numbers stay, those, those trends <coughs> stay relatively consistent in all three areas, the math, science, and the reading. Um, in the reports, you'll, you will also see uh, just graphs like these that uh, show where we, stand, uh, where we rank on average um, uh, compared to all, many of the other countries that participate. Um, and it, again, this, this is another way of representing that level of the, the proficiency level. So where we have, um, you can see the numbers nationally. Um, at levels five and s four, five, and six start to tail off, whereas uh, the percentage of our students that are still performing um, at the f levels four, five, and six, the highest levels of performance are still quite high and uh, great discrepancy b between there and the rest of the, the country. So this, the preliminary information, not the information we just received, um, has been shared with the department heads. And I mean, 
what's always nice about these things is you don't want you want them to tell you something that's a little different from what you know, um, <clears throat> but you also would like not to be surprised um, because one would hope that you're doing things that you expect. So in English, if you look that actually already as we went into this, but now two of the goals are student ownership of text, more variety of text, um, higher engagement, and more student individualized reading. And then in math, again, they're working on engagement. Um, and so we'll look and see. There's a question we're discussing. They call, the OECD called me just a couple of days ago to ask whether we were gonna re-administer the test this year or next year. Um, and we were discussing it and we will defer if somebody has a strong opinion. At this point, I think our sense was that we would give the Eng new English curriculum a couple of years to run, um, as well as the math curriculum rather than administering a new test when we don't really think we're likely to see a big, significant change. Um, but we have a little bit of time to make that decision um, if there are questions that people have. So that's basically it. Um, just thinking what, uh, you Paul hit most of the things in the head. But I did want to go back to the one which I just thought was particularly interesting. The one about restricted reading. So um, that was pretty striking in that 65% of our students report being restricted readers. If you look at the regression line, usually being a restricted reader um, goes along with the penalty in terms of overall reading scores. Our students didn't have that. It was actually a straight line and then it dropped when you went to the non-deep readers in terms of scores because they break them out by the, the court, those six zones. But being a broad reader is a virtue in and of itself, whether or not it affects your overall reading score. So that's why it's something we're working on. Thank you. All right. Quite, yeah, go. The, when the, does this take, test take into consideration the, the difference in curriculums with the other countries and stuff? Um, so. Or the emphasis you know, on certain areas and things of that nature? It, it doesn't. I mean, the PISA is a international comparison. It's given a huge, they showed us a map. I mean, all the OECD countries plus another huge range of countries across the world, it targets 15-year-olds. Um, so it is curriculum based. So it is possible that in some schools they have taught stuff that we haven't taught. Um, and if that's the case, that's the case. But and if I may, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the economic factor, or the, the disparity uh, in it, again, that would be different from community or country to country and things of that nature. I saw it very close in China, probably because there isn't right. that much of a difference in the, in the uh, socioeconomic groups. But, I'm just wondering, are we comparing apples to oranges sometimes? Well, I mean, the idea of the test, I mean, one of the big conversations in the test in the comparative data is to look at the schools and both schools and countries where the systems are getting the same levels of performance with low SES students. Because one of the big, I mean, if you look, and I debate some of these, but if you look, I mean, if you look in, the, in China and they do a regression line against socioeconomic status, they have a slant. If you look in Canada, they, it's, it's, and it's the same line every single time. They all pretty much parallel one another. And so then the question is, does China do a better job with their low socioeconomic status students than Canada does? And there's a lot of conversations to have there about that. So that's part of why Arlington was stood out, not just because of our high levels of performance, but because we outperformed the regression line, we are mm -hmm. sitting way up above mm -hmm. um, not only, you know, it's not just that we're at this end, but we're at there, this end even when you regress it and take out the effects of socioeconomic status. Thank you. I, I think that's really important because I think that one of the points people make is that our success is a function of our socioeconomic changes that are happening in, in the town. And it's, it's great to see that we're outperforming that. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, one is it timed? Um, is the test timed? And then two, I actually just missed how many students took the test. So we sent a list of every eligible student mm -hmm. and they sent us back a list of what, 85? 85, okay. Um, and then we had a response rate of what, about 80, 70 students took it? Yeah. 69 students took the te uh, okay. sat the test. Um, the cognitive section happened in uh, two one-hour blocks, so it was it was a timed. Um, most students finished with time remaining, mm -hmm. so um, I don't know that time was 
time did not appear to be a factor that can you know, constricted their responses. And, and then there, I just there's a, there's a characteristic where they call them time driven tests. Mm -hmm. Like they give you an hour, but it's supposed to take 40 minutes. So even though it's timed, it's not a time driven test. Right, right. And then I just want to encourage you um, to get the updated um, uh, presentation to, to, to Karen. Yeah, we'll send you the report with the new Great. data. Great, okay, yeah. terrific. You have the presentation, right? There's a new report. We we did, I, I'm, we sent out the earlier report to yeah. the whole school. Yeah, we did have that, but right. the presentation is a little different than what yeah. we, oh, we received. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if you click on the link, it's live, so it'll be the same. I didn't upload it to know the No problem. <laughs> okay. So just, yeah. Great. Yeah, what we added in, for anyone who cares, is just the two charts at the top for math and science. Those were erroneously left out. So it's really impressive what you see. And of course, I'm going to ignore that and focus on something which wasn't as impressive. Um, I was looking at on the discipline climate things. It's not on your graph. It's, on, it's in the report. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, I thought it was interesting that they did both the school average and then the percentile of the highest performing kids and the one of the lowest performing kids. And they just they saw a big difference. I'm a little confused how they, with what they're showing, how they get the average that that the school is, but what it made me wonder how we're doing for classes for our lowest performing kids. They reported significantly more chances of taking longer to get going to work, taking longer that that they can't work well, that the teacher has to wait a long time to quiet down, and I'm just thinking that. You know, is there anything that we can do to help those teachers and these, and therefore these students? So I'm, I'm not looking at the one in front of you, and if I remember the ones I looked, at, yeah, that's not going to help. But I, I look pretty closely at them, and um, so we did note that, and it's unfortunately not surprising, right? That often your lower performing classes also have more classroom management issues. It's obviously something that we're working on all the time. There's a whole range of things that we're doing in terms of working on classroom climate and school engagement and collaborative problem solving and other methods to support students. Mm -hmm. um, if I recall, I mean, there's, there's only, if I remember right going through there, there was only one element of classroom management where we actually were below the national average. Um, and I, I could be wrong on that. It doesn't, have this one it doesn't put it up against national averages, but, you know, that is obviously an area we work on. And I think the two things, I mean, are in the lower level classes, students talk about issues about classroom management and they talk about levels of challenge and engagement, right? To make those classes be more engaging is going to all A, help with classroom management <coughs> and B, help with student learning. I ran out of water. Thank you. Any other questions? Go, oh, Kathy, go ahead, sure. Well, that's another question. Um, I, I know that when it was in June or July, you got a call from OECD wanting you to come to, to present because of the high number of our students perform at these highest levels. And the question is, well, why? What is the hypothesis of why our students are doing so well and performing at a higher level than will be predicted by socioeconomic. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about yeah. some of your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, so I thought pretty hard about that. And the answer when they first asked was, because everyone went around and said, well, we're doing this and we're doing that. And I said, well, honestly, and I, this is really true, we're doing everything. But they didn't like that answer. Um, and I think the better answer in terms of our intent <clears throat> sort of breaks into at least three or four major areas. It, if there's change, because some there have been sort of improvements over time. I mean, first is and foremost is the professionalism of our staff, treating them like professionals, expecting them to be professionals, and the fact that they are. Our staff come able and ready to learn and to teach kids, and the expectation has always been that we focus not on getting kids over the line for the MCAS, the basic levels that all of our staff and all of our departments are focusing on challenging students at the highest level. So that's the first. The second, which is enormous, right, is these are students 
towards the end of their sophomore year, which means one and three quarters of a year of high school. So the honest truth is that the students are doing that well because they've been in a K through 12 system that is strong throughout. And clearly one of the things that everyone says and everyone understands is necessary to that is a strong sequence curriculum, that they're moving selectively through progressively harder and more important texts, more important mathematical content, so that they are, you know, it's called a guaranteed and viable curriculum. They actually get taught all the stuff they're supposed to be taught, um, and it is all covered and taught to them effectively. Um, and then the last is targeting support towards our lowest achieving students. Um, you know, because of our performance, periodically people call and they say, what is it you do? Do you look at data? And we look at data, we look at data like this, but the most important data we look at, and that's huge credit to our department heads, is lists of kids' names who are not performing. Because the lists are short enough um, that we can identify specific needs. So we'll have a class because there's four kids coming into that section. Or we'll target support to one or two kids. Because if you're going to bring up everybody, you really have to have that net be kid by kid in terms of targeting support. And then the last, I have to believe, over the last few years has been a lot of effort around the overall school culture in terms of making it positive and supportive, that safe nurturing um, and caring. What is it? Learning, caring, and connecting as a school, which is in our mission. So just to summarize, in, <clears throat> in comparing our, our school to the top performing schools in the world, which is in Shanghai, China, we're, we're, pretty, mu we're pretty much equal to them in math and all, all subjects, except we're all pretty, we're, we're pretty much equal to that's... I think that's underestimating us. We do better than they do. We do better than they do, okay. <laughs> all right, I'm just trying to look at these numbers. We okay. have higher levels of performance, um, higher levels of students at the highest levels and average yeah. levels of performance at or equal to them. Okay, but the mean student performance is right around there. Is right around China. Okay, the mean student performance is right around China. And, and in Massachusetts schools, the mean student performance of the schools in this were about the same as we were, they're about the same as China, it looks like. Right. So that says something for Massachusetts schools. Well, I mean, on the PISA test, Massachusetts, if it were a country, it would be second only to Singapore. Yeah. Great. That's what I wanted to get out there. Okay, Paul. I mean, the thing that I, I find to be really outstanding and uh, amazing is not only <coughs> the academic performance, but we have a climate in this building that is superior to almost every high school that I've seen. You know, walking through when the kids are in there, the, the, the adults have good relations with the kids, the kids have good relations with each other. It's a positive environment. It's a good place to be. Um, and uh, this is just one bit of evidence that demonstrates that we've got something really wonderful happening at Arlington High. Yes. The other Only thing we I had said, a good building. The other thing I said at the thing was, to be honest, we kind of just have the magic sauce. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff happening in the school. And we've hired well. We've got good people working here. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank La you very much. Last okay. comment. Oh, yeah, um, sure, I, I thought all those answers were, were right on. I, uh, a lot of credit goes to the professional staff. But I think you see here how important it is that we have that K-12 vertical alignment mm -hmm. by a department chair that can make sure that what's happening in all of our elementary mm -hmm. schools is consistent because they all are going to come to our middle school, they're all going to come to our high school, and they need to have the same um, opportunities, the same curriculum, the same encouragement to perform at these high levels. and so. What we're seeing is a, the results of a very systematic way of how we are doing education in Arlington. And, um, and, but I agree with you that, uh, all that, you know, it's really the, the high school, I think, is exceptional also in the positive culture that's um, it's here. But we, I mean, mm -hmm. serious hats off to K through 8 in terms of giving us students every year who are able to learn, engaged in school, <clears throat> at the highest level so we can engage with them um, at, and move them forward. It's really, it's a lot of fun every year. Yeah, I, I just say that uh, over the past few years there have been substantive major improvements at the Odyssey. So, yep. um, you know, everybody's on their game. It's really impressive. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Is Dondria Maxwell here? Go to the football game if that's okay. Yeah, go, yeah. <laughs> Go have fun.
Uh, Dandria Maxwell is not here yet. Okay, okay, as soon as she comes, we'll take that up. Okay, so we have Cindy Bouvier and... Ivy LaPlante. Ivy LaPlante, Ivy, yeah. Good to see you, Cindy. There are rumors that you retired. I'm so <laughs> glad you had, that's their fault. <laughs> well, before they, could I say a couple words before they start? Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. It's, been, it's a great team effort as we do these kinds of look at risk factors. Um, <clears throat> I've mentioned before, and it's, um, we, have, we have two uh, youth risk uh, behavior surveys. And one's at the middle school, one's at high school. The high school we are doing differently. Uh, the Middlesex League Superintendents, which is our athletic league, um, decided that we would like to see um, a comparison of our own of our own league so that we are there as uh, supports and references for each other in terms of what we might be doing in our district that to help um, perhaps minimize certain behaviors so as a group we went to Paul Andrews who's president of the Winchester Hospital and and, and, and connected to Leahy <coughs> and Leahy was gave us a grant to be able to administer um, this survey at the high school uh, online. We had the infrastructure to do that now. And uh, we were able to get our results much more timely uh, this summer, in fact. And, and Cindy and I were very much part of that. Um, and, and were very helpful also in helping with the questions we also wanted to ask that were not on the survey. Every district could ask ten, up to 10 questions. So um, I just want to give you a little background on that. Uh, and uh, as we move forward, we're going to move forward with uh, this li link and working together with the league. And the middle school will also uh, be brought into that. Some of the league school, middle schools did do it, but we already had in place uh, the testing for this year. <coughs> so um, as Kathy mentioned, this was a brand new <coughs> Um, initiative this past March in order to have all of our students do this on the um, on the computer so 906 students took at the same time you know they, they actually took it online um, which was a huge feat and um, the only thing that we compromised a little bit were some of our questions that we originally had because we're part of a larger group now so throughout the survey throughout the results you'll see some discrepancy here and there and it's because we had to change some of the questions that we ask or the way that we ask them. But we were able to put in 10 of our own. And then um, we were able to put in um, ones that have to do with the substance use grant with the, um, with the perception questions. So um, I mean, to that, I think that's basically the, the background between, of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. You've seen this. We've been doing it for years. Um, and I thought I would start off with um, a little bit about the trending of the tobacco. So if you take a look at the, at the trends, Arlington High School students report below average lifetime use. And you can see on the, on the bottom there, that is the line of the, of the use of Arlington High School students. And you can see the Massachusetts state and then the national average of, of tobacco use. So um, again, it's excellent. Our, our use is excellent, um, only about three let me put it in the positive way. 96 percent, 96 plus percent of our students do not use tobacco. Okay, so that that is huge, um, and, and don't use it on a regular basis. Or I haven't used it in the last 30 days. So this starts with, with the Sanborn grant. I mean, um, a grant that is given to us every year, where we do programs in the elementary schools, through the middle school, through the high school. So um, this is this is something that we talk about all the time. <coughs> Okay, and on the next slide, you can see that um, the lower than national average high school students in Arlington, Mass, report similar recent um, use. So that's in the past 30 days, that's th that line there, which is, um, which is much less. <clears throat> and the only difference would be the e-cigarette and the vaporing, which the, has increased a little bit. Um, so in, the pa in a lifetime, e-cigarette use is increased slightly from um, so, uh, e-cigarette use. Uh, sometimes it has tobacco in it, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it has increased slightly from 17% to 22%. So that's in the past 30 days. Um, you know, lifetime use can go down. Uh, it's one of our 
parts that we do focus on now when we talk about the e-cigarettes, it's the newest trend. So, okay, um, I believe after that, we're going, we're going to move on to, by the way, I guess I should have introduced myself. I'm Cindy, and this is Ivy, for those of you that we haven't met before. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Yeah. And um, we're going to move on now to the substance use portion of this. And Ivy, who is president of the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition, will, um, will present these. Great. So yes. Um, so as you, I'm sure, are probably aware, our coalition functions to prevent and reduce substance use among youth in Arlington. Um, we've been around since 2006, but only formally received our funds through the Drug-Free Communities Program, through the SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, through the federal government in 2008. So um, I wanted to put these trends up just to, so, to, so we could show you how far we've come from um, the very first survey in 1995. Um, and so as you can see when, we're, when we go through these, um, our rates are really, um, they're quite extraordinary. Um, I do want to point out too that when we are talking about this, we're talking about use rates. Um, however, whenever we try to present our information to the community, we always want to put the positive spin. Mm -hmm. So as Cindy said, yes, 4% are using tobacco, but when we're presenting to the community, we want to say 90%, 96% are not using, um, because that's really the norm of our community, and we're trying to promote that use among um, students and among parents and community members. Um, so yeah, so that was alcohol. So this is recent alcohol use. Recent alcohol use is um, defined by past 30-day use, um, and you can see that it's been declining quite steadily um, since 1995. It was a sharp increase in 2016, but I'm not too concerned with that as we are back down um, to our normal rate in 2017. Um, marijuana use as well, we only started testing for it in 2009, um, but you can see we definitely are below the national and state standard. Um, I would like to point out that the 2017 results of um, the Massachusetts and national YRBS have not been um, released yet. Um, they are also on a two-year basis, but it takes a little bit more time to tabulate their results. So um, unfortunately, we can only compare ourselves with uh, two years prior. Um, so Arlington High School student, the recent past 30-day use has, uh, as you can see, fluctuated. We're the dark, can I see this? Mm -hmm. We're the dark blue line, so um, we're the one that kind of goes like, <laughs> um, which there's a lot to um, you know, add about that. I, our coalition is really concerned with this. Um, we know that there's been a lot of ma recent marijuana use um, in the community, and there's a lot of uh, reasons why you can suggest that might be happening, um, but our coalition is doing a lot, which I'll get to um, later on. Um, oh, I guess that's it. So that was actually supposed to be lifetime use. This is, so this is perception of harm. Um, so as Cindy was saying, um, perception of harm is something that we also do track. And I just want to point out that um, as the perception of harm of using marijuana decreases, um, the use rate of marijuana is slowly increasing, um, which is a trend that is seen across all substances. Whenever there's a decrease in perception of harm, there's an increase in use. Um, so currently, I think this is on my other slide, 37% um, of Arlington High School seniors believe it is harmful to use marijuana. Um, and that's compared to 97% of all Arlington High School students who believe uh, prescription drug use is wrong um, and harmful. So it is de definitely a point of concern, and I'll get to that a little bit later. So prescription drug misuse. I know we've been hearing a lot about the opioid crisis and the heroin epidemic that's hitting our young people, especially those who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, but I'm happy to say that our Arlington students are not um, using these substances in high school. As you've seen from the previous slides, it starts with marijuana, it starts with alcohol, and then transitions into greater substance use such as heroin and opioids um, later on. So you can see our um, results are, are pretty good. We definitely are lower than the Massachusetts and state average, Massachusetts and national average. Um, so a little bit about mental health. We thought this was always important. Um, substance use is definitely directly related to mental health. Um, and Arlington's actually this, this top line. Um, so this, the top line is, oh, this is all of Arlington, I'm sorry. Um, the top line is those students who reported that they felt they were under too much stress most of the time or always. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there's a trend of increase. Mm -hmm. um, this blue line, which is kind of, if it, it's at the bottom, for the most part, except for an increase over here. 
um, is this middle data point. It's they felt sad or hopeless every day for the past two weeks. Um, and that, according to the Department of Health and Human Services, constitutes a major depressive episode. Um, it's students who report that they feel sad or hopeless every day to the point where they stopped doing their normal activities for up to two weeks. Um, and so that, as a community, we're definitely concerned with as well. Um, and this bottom data point right here is those students who reported seriously attempting suicide. So that's that one. Um, we're a little lower uh, than depression, which is good. Okay, so um, this next section, I thought it would be great to look at how we compare to Middlesex, right? That's why um, we combined all of our efforts to produce Middlesex reports so we could um, see how we're doing it with communities that relate to Arlington. Um, so these next slides uh, really show um, how we relate to that. Andy, you want to talk about it? Um, sure. So this, this slide in particular shows um, students who have ever tried a cigarette currently smoke cigarettes, ever used electronic vapor products, and currently use electronic vapor products. And as you can see, um, the red dot. We're the, the red, red star. And the red dot. We're the red star. And the red star is below all averages, um, even in the Middlesex League and Massachusetts and in the United States. Um, the one place that was a little bit concerning was current use of electronic vapor cigarettes and also ever used electronic vapor cigarettes. Just because it's the new trend, it's something that's new, it's something that's come up, it's something that's definitely harmful to them. So we're, we're paying close attention to that. And something to note is that through the Sanborn Foundation and through our coalition, we are doing efforts to directly impact this. We have a youth uh, club called Club 84, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, it's a state initiative to prevent tobacco use among high school students in Massachusetts. Um, and Arlington is definitely a top chapter. They won the um, greatest outreach last year and the greatest peer support. Um, and our advisor for it, Karen Dillon, was actually nominated as um, best advisor. So we definitely are um, topping the charts for that. And, and you can see that it's, it's working because our rates are so low compared to the rest of Middlesex County, uh, Middlesex League, excuse me, Massachusetts and the United States. Um, we also, our coalition works very closely with the Board of Health. Um, and there's been several initiatives put in place to uh, prevent tobacco use among youth. We do regular tobacco compliance checks. Um, we've increased the age of tobacco use to uh, 21 here in Arlington, and also removed all flavored tobacco products um, to try to decrease youth uh, use of these flavored um, e-cigarette devices. So alcohol use, um, Arlington again, we're the red dot. So it's Arlington is the red uh, star, Middlesex League is the yellow square. We have a blue circle is Massachusetts and a green is USA. I feel like I'm in a kindergarten classroom here. Um, so again, you can see that we definitely have, Arlington High School students have reported lower alcohol use than students at Middlesex League, Massachusetts, and the United States. Um, and again, you know, initiatives that we're working on, we're doing compliance checks with the police um, and our board of selectmen. Um, we have a youth club at the high school, <coughs> our student advisor club, and they provide a lot of great resources to us um, and serve as good role models for their students. Um, and we also try to host substance-free activities to promote the norm that the majority of students are not drinking in Arlington. Um, they're not engaging in these risk behaviors. Um, something to note, this currently drank alcohol in school property. It is very low, but we also are right in line with Middlesex League, where the rest of them were a little lower. This is lifetime use. Okay. Um, so student reported marijuana use, again, we're lower than Middlesex, Massachusetts, and the national average. Um, all good news, and I think a lot of it has to do with, um, uh, you know, bringing uh, knowledge to this issue. We've done presentations, our coalition has done presentations at the high school. Um, we've provided, um, you know, similar, similar response to marijuana as we do with tobacco, um, and we're hoping that in the next few years we'll be able to get a, a better handle at, tobacco, at marijuana regulation and control now that it's legal. Um, and I also want to note that I'm sure you're all aware of the Botvin Life Skills Training Grant that the public schools and the coalition um, received from the Sims Foundation over the summer. Um, and that is a substance use prevention education curriculum that is going to be taught in FACTS classes starting in sixth grade. Um, and we're really excited about this because I think that the earlier you start talking about the harms related to substances, including marijuana, um, the less likely students are to engage in these substances. This is you know, produced by data um, and you know, obviously anecdotal reports as well. 
Um, so this next slide is uh, illegal drug use in um, Arlington High School. I have cocaine, heroin, uh, recently used prescription drugs not prescribed to them. As well, you can see our, our rates are similar to the rest of the communities. And then this one right here is offered, sold, or given an illegal drug on school property within the last school year. Um, we wanted to point it out because although it is uh, similar to Middlesex League, a little higher, it's still 14% of students are engaging in these um, illegal activities on school property. Um, a coalition, again, we're uh, looking into providing training called DITEP training. Um, it's the fancy word for teaching high school educators to um, recognize signs of drug use um, and to refer students to appropriate services. So if we increase the capacity of our school staff to be able to notify this, notice this, then we can get students help when they need it, um, especially if they're using or dealing drugs on school property. Um, okay, so this next slide, I think there's only a few more, so bear with us. Um, this next slide is about mental health risk. And across the board, um, students in Arlington report higher mental health risk than students in Middlesex League, uh, Massachusetts, and the United States schools. Um, so again, you know, it's, it's right sandwiched in between uh, Massachusetts and Middlesex League. Um, this is our, our report of feeling sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks. That's our major depressive episode we were talking about. Um, this one is self-harm. Uh, this one is attempting suicide. This one's a plan about suicide. And this is actual attempt of suicide. Um, but we've done a lot of work with the Samaritans over this past year, um, which is an organization to prevent suicide um, in Arlington. So I think that although this was a report from this year, that um, we definitely are increasing our efforts. And I know the school community is as well. So <clears throat> the next slide I thought was really um, important given the school improvement plan that Arlington High has for this coming year and um, all of the community building that's going on and the, the new committee that is, is formed. So 68.6% of our students said that they have an adult that they would go to. That, that may be a teacher, it may be another adult in the building or someone and so forth. But what will be interesting is seeing um, this year the school community building committee is gathering all the data that they can on different programs and what's going on in the building and so on and so forth. There's three committees. There's the, the data committee, there is the communication committee, and then there is the, um, Advanced. the advisory, advisory committee. And so between the three of those, um, they're working on it this year. The school improvement plan is included on it. Um, and and Matt has made, Matthew has made this a, um, a real goal for the, for the, for the whole school. So it'll be interesting to see what the data is in two years when we repeat this, mm -hmm. um, given that this is, this is a full-blown effort and it's this year and next year and, and we'll see what the data is. So the, the trend in this will be very interesting to see if, we, if we're able to increase um, that number of beyond 68%. Okay. What about the juniors? Oh, and, and so, so this the is juniors a was a little concerning, you're right. Because the, if you can see up here, um, we had very few juniors that said that they had somebody that they would go to. So that is something, and these are the current seniors for this year. So what that is, is it chemistry, is it culture, is it, is it that year? You know, there's all those questions that are in there. And, uh, and again, the data will be looked at this, this year for what's going on. But it is concerning. Uh, is, it is the bleep. So, <clears throat> Hollington High School students report. So, I, th I really thought this slide was important um, given even the forum, the parent forum that happened last night. So, Hollington High School students report lower electronic bullying and sexting rates, but similar screen time as students as middle sex leagues. So, you can see again where the red star, and we have fewer students that are electronically bullied. We have Students somewhere in the middle there that They're played right a video you. computer game uh, for three hours a day. Now we, we did in the question, um, I just looked that up, that we did extract except for school activity, um, homework, homework activity. So, so people are using the comp their computers or having screen time for more than three hours a day. And the last one, which was probably um, the most concerning to me, but we are certainly better than the Middlesex League, is ever sent or received a sexual message electronically. That's 38%. That's 340 students. So 906 <laughs> took it. To me, that's extremely concerning. Um, 
And given last night's performance, I think it's very concerning among our parent community because we had um, a large crowd at the Middlesex Partnerships for Youth presentation last night, which was on um, cyber safety. And so there was a lot of people and we had a, a, a great audience and we had a couple of parents that were into the tech world and, and offered some suggestions as well, which was wonderful. Um, the woman who presented last night did a phenomenal job. She is also presenting to grade 9, 10, 11, 12 on our wellness day on December 13th. And tomorrow during the cabinet meeting, we will talk to the principals about other possible presentations to the lower grades. Now I know some people think it's kind of late to start in 9, 10, 11, 12. You should start in fifth grade because that's when they're getting their phones and so on and so forth. But they really need um, reinforcement in the high school years. They really do because there's some big things happening there with the college process, getting jobs, and we all know that everybody's being Googled these days, so mm -hmm. we have to keep them safe. That's what we're trying. So again, um, you know, how are we? How are we reacting to all this? We're trying to be proactive. We're trying to react with programs, with forums that, that will help to assist this. So on um, on our last slide, um, Ivy mentioned the Botvin Skills Life Training, um, Life Skills Training that's happening at the Audison this year. Again, that was a grant that came through. It's wonderful. It's a sustainable grant. Uh, it's being implemented by the Facts Department, and uh, and so we're very excited about that. The Guiding Good Choices Parent Workshop is happening again this fall and this spring. That's to help parents to have their children make better choices and, and help them in guiding them toward that. So that will happen. Um, the ESPER training, Ivy mentioned, is happening. The Wellness Day is happening in, this, in December this year at Arlington High School. Uh, there'll be a marijuana com a community forum that happens in March, and then also um, Michael Brantwein uh, workshops in April. And he's doing workshops at the Audison for parents, for students. So and staff as and well. And staff. Questions. Paul Okay, uh, two questions. Um, you, you, you were showing some of the national data surrounding marijuana use. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question that I have is, uh, within the national data or from other states like Colorado, have you seen a change in these numbers in states where marijuana has been legalized? And my assumption is the answer is going to be yes. And are we getting some idea what we should be doing in that context from states who've already made that move? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, something I forgot to point out is that, well, I, I did point it out, but not explicitly, mm -hmm. that the results from Massachusetts and the United States for this section um, was taken from the 2015 report. Mm -hmm. So again, it is still two years behind where we mm -hmm. currently are. Um, and so if you look at the data from, there's a variety of different sources, mm -hmm. and depending on which way you, you roll, you can in, interpret the data differently. Mm -hmm. um, but there have been studies that have been done for these communities in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ones where they had, the problem with Colorado is they didn't really know where they were starting. There was mm -hmm. not really a baseline data. Um, and so they had a hard time seeing, well, what's the impact if they didn't know where they were starting from? Um, we're confident we do have a lot of great baseline data here in Massachusetts um, so that we can track what happens over the next few years. Um, but in the long and short of it is that yes, that you know, perception of harm is definitely decreased mm -hmm. and use rate, um, it has increased in some communities, especially where um, there are uh, retail pot shops available. Um, but you know, it, it's still to be continued. Um, there's a great report by the Rocky Mountain Haida, high, inten high intensity drug trafficking area. Mm -hmm. um, and they do a fantastic report. They keep updating it every three months or so. And I encourage you to take a look at least even the snapshots of that. Um, and, and you can really see the data that they, that they have shown um, to really show the, the impact of mm -hmm. marijuana use um, in those communities in Colorado. And if you watch the vision, uh, not vision 2020, if you watch 2020, mm -hmm. the governor of Colorado was on and said, use our data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Use it. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. we are starting it and we're providing it. So please mm -hmm. use our data. So. And, and secondly, the, the thing that, you know, I, I'm pleased with a lot of the trends and where we're going and where we're positioned relative to 
similar communities. But the thing that really has me anxious was the slide with the uh, hopeless, depressed, and uh, stress. Um, what can we do? Well, I think that <clears throat> we're trying to do as much as we can <coughs> guidance through connections with adults, mm -hmm. um, through discussions of homework and discussions of projects and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think a certain, a good percentage of students said that it is homework mm -hmm. that, um, and schoolwork mm -hmm. that has them stressed the most. Some are feeling that they're oversubscribed, they're working jobs, they're trying to be athletes, they're trying to be students, they're trying mm -hmm. to sign up for AP classes. Um, this trend has been going on for mm -hmm. the last 15 years um, with AP courses and kids like mm -hmm. trying to push themselves to be the best that they possibly can and then, and then breaking. And so I think through advisory classes, through wellness days, through um, there was an opportunity yes, uh, today at the high school, I saw that one of the teachers during X block offered mindfulness classes. Mm -hmm. any, any students who want, some, uh, want to come down and practice some mindfulness mm -hmm. strategies and techniques, please do. Through these types of activities and initiatives, we're hoping that we can address some of this. I mean, it's doubled since 2007. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it was going up then, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Going along with what Paul just said, and first off, I want to thank you for this. This is valuable information, really appreciate it. And I also want to state that in no way am I con talking negative to the staff or to the administration in my comments now. But part of the data you shared with us is 48% of the students report feeling they are under much stress, most of the time or always. 25% of the students report feeling sad or hopeless almost every day for two or more days a week. Uh, we saw this last year, it, again, it's up. Mm -hmm. We know this, it, it's all over for all the reasons you just stated. Um, we've, we heard that information last year. We've created a position uh, for this, and it is my hope through that position, your work and everybody together, we hope to see these numbers dro drop. I, I mean, numbers are numbers. These are kids, mm -hmm. they're, they're very valuable, and, and the stress that's on them, I think it has to be a combined effort of educating uh, the parents and us together to work together, to work on, uh, these things are not gonna go away. Society is putting this on this. We can't tell our students, don't become athletes, don't become, uh, mm -hmm. take all these jobs because they'll be left behind in the long run. But how to deal with it? And, and I think it's an important part to work in collaboration with the parents uh, that if somebody is stressed, to identify for us to help them right away before they go down. Thank you again for all your work. And I think that the, the, the guidance departments are trying to do mm -hmm. that through, through classroom forums and parent forums that they do. We're certainly trying to give parent strategies to do things uh, through right. the regular parent forum group. And, and we're really trying to work with the students well, now and trying to give them some of these strategies With this, with well. this new position, hopefully there's a coordination, there's uh, and it working together. I can say that she's re Sarah Bird has reached out to our coalition. She came to our first meeting of the year. I mean, she's very proactive in her Good. role, mm -hmm. um, and so already starting to make these relationships happen. So, I'm I'm think seeing good things so far. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I want to echo similar things. Uh, one of the things I'm impressed with is we, as a country and as a town, have put resources into. Um, making sure that kids don't use tobacco and don't use drugs, no mm -hmm. alcohol, and we're seeing success. We're seeing those numbers go down. And that is a direct result of the kind of attention and the quality of the programs, such as the coalition's programs. Mm -hmm. And we haven't quite yet done that with mental health issues, right? The, right. I mean, it, we've been reaching crisis proportion for the last 10 years, not just in Arlington, but across the state, across the country. And we really, I think, as a country, haven't, haven't put that kind of attention to it. Um, I am pleased to see that we, it seems like we've stopped the bleeding, at least. That the numbers, um, the three-page report that you gave us, aren't significantly worse than they were a couple of years ago. And in our previous reports, we had kept seeing the numbers jumping, big jumps, and then it seems a little bit stopping the bleeding. I have to say this is a complicated problem. 
you know, I was in incredibly high stress high school, you know, my best in the country, but we only took one or two AP classes, right? And now, you know, minimum three, four, five, right? Of a, of a student who wants to go to a good college. Um, and so it's, it's a complicated problem. It's not just a school problem, it's a home problem, <laughs> it's a, you know, a society problem, um, but that we really need to take this seriously. So I think <coughs> we were awarded a grant about five, six years ago now, the success grant, which I came to you and spoke to you about. And that really got us going at the elementary level. Unfortunately, we were not awarded it for the secondary level, but we were awarded it for the elementary level. And you know, the implementations of some of those programs and the fact that we now have a social emotional learning person intact and can see those programs through is really amazing. I mean, the responsive classroom, the open circle trainings, the tools of the mind trainings, the mm -hmm. social thinking, and the fact that um, three years ago, when the principals were setting their priorities for um, budget reasons, they all were in <coughs> agreement that social workers need to stay. So, so I mean, we, we are putting resources in. Um, we just hope the results will follow mm -hmm. along. Um, I just, I'm also echoing the concern. I wanted to point out, I, I had seen the report. I didn't see your, your presentation, so I was just paging through the report. Sure. And one of the things I noticed was the proportion of students who reported not having eight or more hours of sleep was 75%. And that plus the other number, I, I can't find it right now, but that they were playing video games or computer for three or more hours a day makes me wonder whether some of the stress is coming from lack of sleep mm -hmm. and you know that the all of these things are interacting stress so of being disconnected or too yeah. connected i think they're just tired <laughs> i mean in, in part and i think some i'm not saying i'm not trying to diminish mental illness or anything mm -hmm. but i think being tired all the time is stressful trying to think and work and do everything you're trying to do as a high school student while you're tired all the time mm -hmm. is stressful and I just wonder how much of I don't know how much of a factor is that but it, it, it certainly makes me wonder um, two other quick questions um, one I think it's really interesting that you're having these programs and forums, but speaking to someone who couldn't go last night because I had a prior commitment, I'm wondering what are we doing to have the information available for parents who are interested but couldn't attend? Okay, so if you just email us, we will send you any handouts that were definitely given out. Um, some, when, the, when the PowerPoint is shared with us, which it, it often is, um, I did not get the one from last night yet, but um, if the PowerPoint is, is offered to us, then I, I give that. We, we, don't, um, we don't tape them. ACMI is not usually there. To be honest with you, there's a lot of quick Q&A during this as well. And um, I don't know if, uh, how vibrant some of those Q&As would be mm -hmm. and how, many, how, many, how often parents would actually come out in front of a camera to ask the question they were going mm -hmm. to ask otherwise. But again, you know, it could be just <coughs> redirected. The camera could be, but we don't we don't tape them. But we are willing to share any handouts that are given, any PowerPoints that are shared with us. We we give so, and and that happens often. I also want to add that our coalition. Something I didn't say is that every month we have a newsletter. Um, it's written by Karen Dillon, um, and she for the previous month spends the whole time reading scientific articles and new trends, um, different you know hot button issues, and she'll put it in um, our coalition newsletter, which is sent out usually the first or second day of the month. Um, and that is right now we have um, 786. Um, sub subscriptions to it, um, subscribers, and you know we're always um, gaining, uh, asking for more emails to add to the list. Some of you are, I believe, receive our newsletters, um, and you know there's a link on our website, and so we're always trying to promote that because we understand sometimes it's not as easy to have parents um, come to the events that we hold. I do want to say last year we had a, a parent forum um, called Screenagers. It was all about screen time. Um, and there were about, so we had at the Regent Theater, um, and we invited parents and their kids, 
and we had 450 people show up. I mean, it was packed. There were kids, there were popcorn, it was great. Um, and it really, I think, reinforced to our coalition, um, to the parent forum group, that we need to do more events that involve the whole family um, because sometimes parents might not be able to go because they um, can't find a babysitter, you know, don't want to leave their child home alone. Um, so I think having more family-oriented events is definitely important. And we do take feedback from parents at events such as that. And, and one of the big things that came out of that was uh, we need some help with the technology piece, end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Help us out, like, here. How do we block out things? How do we do things? So that's why we called in other people mm -hmm. to come in to just speak to parents last night. Yeah. yeah. The, the, I'm sorry, I had oh. one. The other thing I was wondering is, when I've seen these surveys over the years, and I think they're really helpful, one question I've always wanted to see is an answer to when are the kids using marijuana or, or any of the substances? Because, you know, as a grown up who has now teenagers, um, as someone who sees lots of them here, I've been trying to think, you know, what are things that we can do to keep kids from doing that and i'm thinking you know let's keep them busy but i don't know you know is it after <coughs> school that they get bored or is it always on the weekends or, or what yeah i can definitely speak to that i feel like we ask this question every every month at our meetings mm -hmm. which um I, you know cindy definitely comes to and participates in so you can talk to her for any questions <laughs> um but really we find um that students are participating in these behaviors usually at night um, and usually uh, well there's two two things there's either under parent supervision where parents are allowing um, parties um, in their basement because they find it you know more safe than um, if kids are home alone which for the record is not safe you are encouraging use by holding a party in your basement it's against the law um, and there's a lot of negative consequences that come from that um, the second time students use it is um, in out open spaces um, so in different parks and woods around town um, again, because they try to, they want to leave, um, you know, their parents, their, they just want to be free, um, and, and so they'll have these parties in different woods. Um, one good thing about our coalition is that we are a coalition. It's not just Ivy Schmalz Reed, it's not just Cindy Bouvier, it's the police, it's parents, it's everyone um, on board. And so we're always trying to um, talk to people about when this is happening. Um, we had some students last year who were helping with our school resource officer. Um, anytime they would hear of um, some activity, they would tell him, and then he would, you know, tell the patrol. Um, so there's all these activities that are happening. Um, but what I can encourage you as a parent is, number one, to set really um, high expectations for your kids. Let them know that you disapprove of any substance use. Let them know that it does um, impact their brain um, and really uh, is detrimental to, the, to their health. Um, and number two, let them know that there's consequences for their use so that if this happens, you know, they are able to um, be supported by you. Um, and, you know, there's different studies out there on uh, ways to get your, your child to um, listen to you and to, you know, you talk about safe words, you talk about all those things, um, really having an out. So if the student, if the child is somewhere where they don't want to be, um, but they're afraid because their friends are all there and they don't want to be the kid that, get, you know, leaves home, leaves, gets picked up from their parents at the party, um, you can use a safe word, um, text it, call it, and then the parent can come pick the child up and it's like, oh, well, I, I thought we were picking you up at this time, so there's kind of no questions asked. Um, and so really, and to really have those conversations as early as you can um, with your, you know, they say as, a, as young as not age nine. Um, so that's why I think it's really important that our life skills curriculum is being taught um, in the sixth grade because, um, you know, that's, we should be talking about it earlier and we do through different curriculum in the elementary schools. Um, but we really want to have that conversation as early as we can. Thank you. Uh, so uh, no more questions. I'll just ask two questions. One, <clears throat> you had mentioned, Ivy, that a lot of the uh, programming is dependent on a, one or two federal and state mm. public grants. Are there any of those in, in jeopardy in the coming year? Yes, that's a great question. <laughs> so um, right now we are in year nine. Actually, on Monday, we are starting year nine of our 10-year grant. Huh. Um, the last cycle, so next uh, so September 2019, um, September 30th, 2019, we lose funding. Um, right now we have $125,000 a year, um, and it comes through the federal government. We have a, several Which, other small grants. Of, uh, from the Department of Education? Or? From the Department of Health and Human Services. Health and Human Services. Yep, and then Which from is... there it goes down to um, 
the just, Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration and the Office of National Control Drug Prevention, ONDCP, yeah. through the Drug Free Communities Program. Um, so we did receive, it's, it, there are two five-year grants that you could get, and we received our second one, um, and so now we're about to start year nine. Um, so there's been, there's been discussion, I'm sure there'll be um, more discussion about ways that we can sustain our coalition. Um, you know, we find that all this work is done by all these different departments, but you really need to have one person um, who is coordinating the efforts and making sure that it's happening. Um, and I think that having a coalition director who's in charge of this, you know, outreach, this coordinating of efforts is really important. Um, and so it's something that we've talked about in our department, um, and hopefully we'll be able to talk to um, the school department, you know, uh, in the next few months uh, to see kind of where we can support each other. And this support really has to come from the broad spectrum of people that are on the coalition. It's important that it comes from the schools. It's important that it comes from the police. Important that it comes from the school committee. Important mm -hmm. that it comes mm -hmm. from parents and students and so on and so forth, and, and faith community. So it's, it's really a collaboration. Well, I mean, I think keep the school committee informed. Keep us informed as if there's mm -hmm. any, if that, if that federal funding is in jeopardy, mm -hmm. because we have to talk about ways to keep Right, it so I think, so I, I think jeopardy, um, right, I mean, it was just re-upped for this next year and for the year after. In fact, this year they actually um, have funded the highest amount of coalitions ever in the history of the drug-free communities program. So um, the, our funding is still there and, and still will be at least in the next, um, next two years, which concerns Arlington. However, it's, it's that after um, 2019, that's when I you know, worry to see what, what's going to happen next. We have um, started to have those conversations, but support of the school committee would be fantastic in trying to um, sustain our coalition. Okay, all right, thanks. And the last question is, you know, w one thing that pop, w one connection that I make is um, the higher mental health risks and mm -hmm. uh, the number, the percentage of students who have at least one teacher or other adult mm -hmm. in the school they can talk to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a, that's a concrete mm -hmm. thing that the, the uh, mm -hmm. high school can address. I mean, we have we have an advisory program, right, in high yes. school. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's something that can be re re people can reflect on whether or not that's working mm -hmm. uh, the way it should work. People can reflect on whether or not there's better ways to. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, uh, what are what are some ways to improve that number? Right. So um, <clears throat> because for the number of juniors to be that low, it means something isn't you know, isn't mm -hmm. working. The advisory mm -hmm. system isn't working for the, those kids, or um, they're not getting access to counselors the way they should. But something isn't. Something, something internally, we have a good mm -hmm. high school, a lot of great things going on, but something isn't working. So. Mm -hmm. And this actually is the, um, the, the purpose, the mission, the goal of the community building committee that um, Dr. Janger is spearheading. Um, as a, the coalition leader, I am a part of that committee, which is also nice because I get to see the work of um, the community. And we've also called in a few representatives from um, the Arlington Human Rights Commission and the Arlington Police Department, again, <coughs> to try to get more of a community effort. Um, because you're right, it's not going away anytime soon, so we have to um, build, build this community building as much as we can. The community effort is important, but I'm talking about inside the school itself. Inside the, inside yes. the school, that's mm -hmm. the, the leadership of the school. Right. Relationship. Yeah. Relationship. They've and got to think about, okay, how do we build better relationships between I agree. some mm -hmm. of the students who aren't, the 32% of the students that mm -hmm. aren't connecting mm -hmm. uh, with, with adults in the building. What do we got to do differently inside the school? Mm -hmm. I suspect that number uh, reflects a lot of the kids who are most active in the school. So if you play mm -hmm. a sport, you probably, you know, you probably have an adult to talk to. If you're in a club and you're highly active in that club, you probably got an adult you're comfortable with. I suspect it's the kids that are not mm -hmm. as engaged in the school that feel that way. That's and, often the case. And the building committee this year is working on gathering that, that yeah. type of data. Yeah. It's so important to note, I'm oh, sorry. It's important to note too that um, that's only, so it's 66% was what was reported among all Middlesex League schools. Yeah. So, I mean, we are a little higher, but it is kind yeah, of typical to what's, on. right. It's not a, it's, I mean, I still want, I still care yeah. about that. Yeah, you don't um, want to, you don't want to stop 30%, there. 30%, but. Yeah. But I think it's, I suspect if you really, if you, if there's a way to uh, unpack all that data and you look at that 30%, you would find it's, I'm guessing, some of the less engaged students. Mm -hmm. That's often the case. Yes. Because they just have fewer adults that they're interfacing with on a regular basis in an informal way. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> Great presentation. Thank you, as always. Thanks You're for welcome. having us. Okay. Thank you Good for to see you. Us. Okay. Dondria Maxwell, thank you for waiting. 
uh, we're going to move around the agenda, and um, we're all behind again. <coughs> uh, and we're going to have uh, Ms. Starks. Cindy, you, you chair this committee. Yes, right? I do. Okay. So <coughs> thanks, guys. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so Dondria, come on up. Uh, Dom, Dondria is our nominee to be the uh, school Hello. committee's representative to the Arlington Human Rights Commission. I'm going to turn over to Professor Starks. Who sit, chairs sit, the sit. Sit. You sit down. Okay. Yes. Yeah, We're friendly. Go ahead. Sit. We so, pretend to be. Um, uh, at our last meeting uh, of the uh, Community Relations Subcommittee, um, we did have um, amazingly 10 applications um, for our HRC position. And I really want to thank everyone who um, submitted uh, their um, resumes and their letters. We had many, many uh, great candidates. But um, in the end, uh, we felt that uh, Dondra was uh, definitely um, kind of kind of the person that we were hoping could we could send to the HRC. And so um, I am excited that she is our um, nominee, and our motion is that we uh, all approve her nomination to that committee tonight. Second. Okay, so we have an, a motion by Ms. Starks, a second uh, yeah. by Mr. Hainer. So let's discussion. Do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. I just want to say something. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important for the school committee is that the nominee to the Human Rights Committee be somebody who can be a liaison between the schools and, and the Human Rights Committee and the community. And um, one of the things I think is exciting about you is that you have three kids. I do. <laughs> An elementary school kid, a middle school kid, and a high school kid. Yes. So your <laughs> eyes and ears are going to be everywhere. <laughs> um, I also want to echo what um, Ms. Stark said, um, that we had 10 candidates, um, many of them very high, highly qualified. Um, and we were impressed by um, both your commitment to the, the role, I think, that you, you will be taking on, and, um, and your experience and things that you can add. So oh, thank very exciting. You. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, this is the first time we're meeting because I'm not on the Hi. subcommittee. Uh, thank you for doing this. Could you uh, just give us a 30-second uh, story of uh, right. how you got here and sure. what makes you want to yeah, so, do this work? Yeah, so I'm DeAndrea Maxwell. I've been in Arlington about 13 years, with, moved here with my husband, Joseph. He actually is, I'm from Texas, he's from Mississippi, but we moved here um, because of his job. So I was a stay-at-home mom for a few years, um, got to know the area. We basically, we lived in Cambridge maybe two weeks and then moved to Arlington. So we've been in Arlington this entire time, mm -hmm. down in East Arlington, and then moved to Stratton. Um, I'm here because my children have been in the school district here, and they've, they've done really, really well. In fact, my youngest was not um, at Stratton for the first three years, and we decided this year that she would go back to Stratton because we thought that was the best place for her. Um, I am very active and supportive of them, so I've always tried to be um, in uh, their classroom on the enrichment committee. I do know a lot of the teachers in Mr. Hannah at Stratton, and so, it's very important to me their overall well-being. So I'm here today to, to try to get involved. And mm -hmm. I feel like um, Arlington is my home now. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to be a part of what's happening. So that's why I'm here today. Thank you. And uh, thank you for agreeing to do this for us. Thank you. Any more questions or discussion? So we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Congratulations. Go Thank to work. You. Have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. We're excited. <coughs> okay. Now we're um, going to talk about uh, the superintendent's goals and the evaluation process. So I'm going to let Kathy speak, and then I'll chime in. To talk about change around, is that going to talk a little bit since sort of the parents who are here talk about TAs? Sure, why don't you do that? And then sure. I can get into this other yeah. part. All right, so we're talking about TAs now. Now you got to. Someone asked if she was at our curriculum night. Yeah. The public. Uh, sure, come on up. Sure. No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't want to do it. I already did it. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys very much for having me. I appreciate the time. Just tell us your name. My name is Michelle Bazergan. Okay. Um, my son, it's his first year over at Pierce Elementary School. We moved last August from San Francisco. Previous to moving here, we had been homeschooling. Um, when we moved here, we kind of had the jackpot. 
we have the school that we can walk to, we have wonderful neighbors, um, but I found in homeschooling, connecting with other parents of kids my age was really challenging. So I chose this year to try to go to Pierce and give it a try. Um, I was having, I had some concerns as a parent about going to public school. Um, the ratio of kids to teachers was one thing. Hearing that the school was growing by a third class was a little bit intimidating, but um, I've also heard wonderful things from my community members, the people in my neighborhood about the school, and we were excited to try it. Um, one of the concerns that kind of came up as we were trying it out was that the teacher's assistant wouldn't be available um, on a full-time basis. Um, today we went on a, um, you can hear my nervousness, but um, today we went on a field trip um, and I volunteered as a chaperone. I really want to try to be a part of the community and, and take advantage of the people that we have around us who are wonderful and the teachers are as well. Um, we went on the field trip. We had a great time. We had three parents as chaperones. We picked apples. The day was beautiful. Um, the kids were great. We had eight children, fifth graders, their fifth grade buddies, which is a really awesome program with their kindergarten buddies. Um, we had a really wonderful time, but I've also volunteered as a, in the library to do with their class. Um, to see the interaction between the teacher's assistant and the kids, it just, it seems like such a necessary and vital role. Um, today at curriculum night, um, they talked about how in the future when they do reading and the literacy programs and the math programs that they're going to have the opportunity each week, the students to meet with a teacher to go over what their challenges were, what their successes were, what um, they want to work on for the next week. When thinking about how a teacher's assistant may not be available, that was concerning. Um, there's, there are also, like, in an emergency situation, where, how would one teacher get 21 students out of the third floor to safety? Um, we don't have earthquakes here, like we did in San Francisco, but if there's ever an emergency or a concern, um, I just wanted to be, like, feel comfortable in knowing that all the kids are taken care of. Um, another thing, yeah, it just, I really appreciate having the opportunity to come here tonight. My husband took off of work early. I got friends to watch my child while I went to curriculum night to listen. Um, met my husband at home. He took over the bedtime responsibilities. I found parking. I came here. And I, but I appreciate being able to listen and hear about all the work that you guys are doing as a committee. I never would have guessed that you guys deal with all of these issues. I thought it would have been a lot of blah, 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 blah. And are we going to use this toilet paper versus this toilet paper? <laughs> um, but it was enlightening um, to hear about the youth risk survey, the testing, and how well the students are doing. It's something that makes me feel more confident in making a choice to do to public school versus homeschooling. Um, but there is that concern hearing about how students are stressed, how they may not feel connected to or have a, an adult that they can go out mm -hmm. to reach out to as support. Right now, his schooling, kindergarten for me, I might, I've considered having him go to public school at maybe seven years old. I felt like at five years old, there's still room for me to soak in the cuteness. There's still room for me to observe how he learns. To, I want to protect his curiosity. I want to protect his love of learning. I see that he can have that opportunity to do that in, home, or in public school. I see the relationships that he's making. But again, I want that relationship with the adult, someone else who he's getting, who's going to care for him, to be strong. And if he's with them part time, with one of those people part time, I want him to know that he can go to an adult if he has a concern. It's a big transition. He melts down. He melted down last week and this week after school. He's held it together when he's at school. Um, he's doing really well. But I talked with parents on the way to the field trip about how they're dealing with this transition. They went from three kids 
or three kids to one teacher, maybe in preschool for half a day, maybe four kids to one teacher. And now there are 21 kids to a teacher and a teacher's assistant. And again, to hear that the teacher's assistant will go to part-time. Before coming to this meeting, I was wondering about what the commitment was to the students. Um, hearing what you guys are doing with the youth risk survey, like hearing your concerns about your students, it's, I appreciate it a lot, and it definitely, again, influences my decision about going to public school or not. Um, I'm committed to doing whatever I can to give my son the best, as all the parents are, um, and whatever I can do to help, whether it's volunteering, coming here, um, all right, thank, thank you best. very much. I'm going to let the superintendent uh, talk about the, yeah. the TAs. All right, okay, thank, thank you. you very Sorry. much. Okay, appreciate it. <laughs> and I go away? Yep, you go okay. back. Yep, <laughs> thank thank you. you very much. Yep. Uh, so for the people that are uh, new to kindergarten um, experience, and it is a very difficult uh, transition from going from preschool to kindergarten, we recognize that. Uh, years ago, and I think this dates back until the around 2000, we had a kindergarten grant through the state, and that grant provided the funding for half-day kindergarten teaching assistance. Two years ago, that that grant was was eliminated, and so we had to make a decision as a district at that point if we were going to fund half-day kindergarten TAs out of the operating budget, making a choice, which was about a $200,000 choice, and not funding other things that we also felt that we needed. And we made that choice, and we've continued to make that choice. Um, and so you know, kindergarten half-time TAs are in our budget. Would we like to have full-time? Yes, but it, again, it's balancing out all of the needs of the district, and we'll be doing that as we get into the budget season. The vast, vast majority of our classes in the district are in the range of 20 to 25. There's a, you know, some outliers a little bit lower, a couple a little bit higher, but that's where pretty much the range of our students are. In kindergarten, we try to you know, have those numbers be in the low 20s, and for the most part, that's the case. I think this year, um, Dallin, which went from four kindergartens to three, have a little bit higher numbers, and so, it, and when, when the kindergarten gets into that 25 level, that's when we say that that's just too high. Um, it may not be high enough that we would go to another classroom, but we have a full-time TA, and, and in fact, there are a number of full-time TAs in the district in those kinds of situations. Um, the, in fact, it appears there's one full-time kindergarten TA as well, um, as well as the two half-time. So it really it's, it's really driven by the numbers and also driven by sometimes um, the requirements under an IEP. So we do have TAs full-time, but they, it's, it's as I said, number driven and IEP driven if, they, if, they are, if they're at a certain end of the range. So, you know, this is, a dis this is a discussion that will come up again in the budget year this year if that's something that as we look at all of the needs and we usually have millions of dollars of requests and are able to fund a small fraction of that where that prioritization occurs. Um, in every elementary school, there is a teaching assistant that is, works with the, the special education liaison, and as well as there is a building sub. In, in the large schools, there may be two building subs that can, you know, in difficult situations, be um, used in a particular class, which is exactly what happens. Um, so we, have a, we do have a, a pretty much of a, 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 a an equity formula for how we do this because we want we want um, parents of the schools, the teachers in the schools, and certainly administrators to feel that this is a very thoughtful and fair process for how teaching assistants are assigned. So that's a that's sort of a, a summary. I don't know if anybody wants to ask any other questions about that. Sure. You've all heard this from me before. 
using just straight numbers, body numbers, to me doesn't, as, as a former classroom teacher, does not equate to the need. I appreciate the, the number of 25 being a need for uh, a full-time TA, <coughs> but some classrooms that have 22, 23 students, the time necessary to communicate with those 22, 23 students can be equal to what's the time of 30 students. Each child needs to be assessed to where they are, and I've talked about a weighted classroom to look at to make the determination. Um, we have these two parents here talking about the Pierce School, the classes from the numbers you gave us last week were 23, 23, and 21. Um, for whatever reason, and I'm not trying to get the principal in trouble, the principal thought it was necessary to have a full-time TA at the beginning of the year to make that adjustment. Um, Stratton has two classes of 24 and one class of 20, according to the numbers. Of all the kindergarten numbers that we see here, only one class is listed at 25. Now, Pierce has one, two, three other classes at 25, four classes at 25. They're in the upper grades. Mm -hmm. um, the, I'm just concerned. All the, all the work that's being required by the teacher to do assessments and do a true evaluation, if he or she is running that classroom and they have a whole classroom of students, those students have to be occupied by a TA while the teacher does that professional assessment. Otherwise, if they're trying to do that professional assessment on a one-on-one -on -one basis, which necessarily has to be done at that level, they can't do it unless the students are occupied with someone else. And I don't think we can afford to depend on a half-time person because you've got a full program going. I've said this before, and uh, it needs to be made a priority, and I'm going to make it a number one priority on the budget going forward this year. If we can find it, I think it's very important to adjust our teaching assistants at the lower levels to mitigate any future problems, to find them as soon as possible. Um, schools that have full-time uh, teaching assistants at the at kindergarten and first grade level have far less IEPs at the upper levels because issues are being discovered early and being dealt with. Thank you. Uh, Cindy? Oh, you you want to go by Jennifer. You prefer go. She does. <laughs> I'll go by Jennifer. <laughs> I usually go by Cindy, but I think it was her who wanted. Um, thank you. Um, so since I've been on the committee, which I know is not as long as, as many people, um, this has been a top priority of both parents and teachers. And I think it's important to remind the public how much this is going to cost. Mm -hmm. and, um, and when we go to the town and when we, and when we go for our next override, Operation Override, to remember about the, the things that we think are a priority and how much they're going to cost our, you know, taxpayers um, and our parents. And just sort of, you know, there are ways to potentially push for the things that we need, not maybe this month, <laughs> but over time. And this is, certainly has been shown to be a, a very high priority for both parents and teachers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so again, just providing more background, mm -hmm. you know, during the budget cycle, we do talk with our principals about what their needs are coming up for the year. Uh, historically, we have only had half-time TAs in, mm -hmm. in uh, kindergarten. It's gone you know, relatively mm -hmm. well. Even when people were paying $3,000 to go full-time, mm -hmm. uh, full-day kindergarten, they still only had half-time TAs. Um, but, but mainly because of the tools in the mind curriculum, which you correctly pointed out, uh, the principals did recognize the need mm -hmm. um, to, or at least the desire to have full-time TAs. Um, that's been on their requests for the past two years. Mm -hmm. But as an, as an administrative team, um, we, we can't fund everything on their, on their wish list. So as, a, as an administrative team, they did identify other priorities. And I'm a, a little bit bothered by the lack of communication from your principal about that process because last year, two years ago, they came to us with the request for full-time kindergarten aides. It didn't get funded. I think maybe social workers got funded or something that the team decided was more important got funded. Last year, they came to us again. Um, again, it was on the list, but it wasn't, again, it wasn't a priority. And I specifically said to them, why isn't this a priority? Why is why is it, and it turned out this year it was assistant principals and behavioral support professionals. And they did explain to us why that was their priority. At some of the larger schools, the principal was dealing with so many behavior issues, he doesn't have time to run the, he or she doesn't have time to run the building. So 
that was a decision that the administrative team made, and I wish that would, that had been communicated to you to understand why we haven't been able to fund those positions. But going forward, I agree with my colleagues um, that it is something we should continue to look at, and and I hope that this year um, there will be consideration given in certain circumstances of not not we're not going to be able to have a full-time TA at every classroom that would cost $200,000 district-wide, but maybe an additional TA at each school. Um, we've done that in the past where there, you know, here there might be special needs because the classroom's up on the third floor. I, I don't know, but hopefully uh, there will be some flexibility. We'll be getting more better numbers about how much money we actually do have available very shortly, and hopefully we can take a look at that. Yeah, I know in the past we've asked for and received a listing of how many TAs, that, you know, how many students are in kindergarten classes and how many TAs they have and what percentage of time that they're in there. I mean, it's, it's been a number of years, but we've gotten that in the past. And I'm just wondering if we could get that again this time because I'm having a hard time keeping track of where there's half time, where there's, and, and I just might be sure there aren't any classrooms that have none and, um, there are no classrooms that don't that do not have a half time TA. Um, we do ass we have assigned building subs to schools so that they can be um, assigned where the needs are, and that could be a kindergarten. It could be another grade where there, as as Mr. Hainer was talking about, sometimes there are, are more challenging groups of kids. Um, you know, being able to give more of that kind of support at the at the discretion of a principal is something that I think we would all agree would like to be able to do. And requests like that do come in, and we work on that just to make sure that we can do it. And we've had a number of those already this year and have funded them. So um, we can certainly, but I think, let me see if I understand what you're looking for. You want to know how many TAs are in each building and where they're assigned? No. I want to know just kindergarten. how many, yeah, just how many kindergarten, kindergartens. How many kindergarten, how many students <coughs> are in classrooms, how many TAs, and how long they have TAs for? You know, so like half if half, half time or full time or, or whatever. So we, um, we can and do that. If mm -hmm. there's any, I don't know how to get past confidentiality, but I, I don't want to overlook someone who is in there because it's a special education, you know, assistant or something like that. I, I don't know how to handle that, but if you can think about if there's any way to do okay, that. Okay, well, I'm not gonna, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so. That, that is, dealing with that, my, my thing for clarification would be full-time TAs that have nothing to do with IEPs because if a person is, is a TA for an IEP, they belong to that IEP. They don't belong to the classroom. And I hope they're not being used as part of that group. The, the, the TA should be assigned to the kindergarten as a regular classroom. Any teaching assistants that are part of a, an individual education plan belong to that individual education plan and should not be shared for a whole class. That's my. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. The school committee doesn't. Uh, you know, we're not voting on a budget tonight. But Paul, you want to say? Yeah, right I, I just want to say, you know, we plan this out as best as we can. Yeah. Two things about kindergarten. One, it's the hardest thing to do because we don't have a reliable baseline how many kids we're going to have in kindergarten any yeah. given year in any given school because it's an entry grade. Mm -hmm. uh, numbers can increase and decrease, so we make our best guess. And we did sit here uh, in January, February, March as we're going through the budget looking at our priorities. Um, the other thing is kindergarten is a very challenging grade to teach. It requires a lot of attention on the part of the kids. Um, though there are times in the day where the uh, TA is not as critical as another so that, you know, while half time is not optimal, I mean, uh, through good scheduling and planning with the TAs, uh, and I understand you've got one full time and two half time uh, in the kindergarten right now. Is, is, is that what I'm it hearing? Appears? Yeah, no. we have two half time and one full time. Yeah, so you've got two half time and a full time spread among three classes. So it's not optimal, but it's, it's usually yeah. in that kind of situation where you have one the the the, the afternoon mm -hmm. that teaching assistant will 
support the three classes depending mm -hmm. upon the request. See, the thing, one of the things that happens in kindergarten is that's often we try to schedule the specials. Mm -hmm. So they may be out of music at all. That's, mm -hmm. We try to do that in kindergarten because of this TA situation. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not easy. I mean, we're, uh -huh. we're dealing with very limited resources and we're doing the best we can with the priorities we have. Uh, along with the fact that the enrollment in this district went up three and a half percent last uh, this year, so um, mm -hmm. it, it's a challenge. Uh, and uh, I would like to see full-time TAs uh, in all the classrooms, uh, but the question is going to happen in January and February and March when we do our planning. Uh, how much money do we have, and how do we spread it out? It, mm -hmm. It's not easy. All right, we have to leave it there. Uh, so we're going to talk now about the superintendent's evaluation. Uh, and do you want to go? You want to start off? And yes. Oh, um, well, what we want to talk about is the. Um, <coughs> this is the point in the year where you want to have all the evidence for the district goals for the um, my specific goals. Uh, and the goal that you picked out. So last year we we did this by putting them in Novus, and I think there were a lot of um, issues that couldn't follow them because I think that just the way they get sequenced. So we've gone back to um, what was a sort of a tried and true sort of years ago, and we could try it this way. There is a lot of evidence, and uh, for all of the for all of the goals, including you know, the ones that are specifically um, that you want to look at for me, as well as remember last year in the retreat, we, um, we looked at the, the four standards and decided upon what the evidence would be for those four standards. So what I think the most efficient way to deal with this is I'm going to send you a memo with a lot of this information, but really the point of tonight is the, we have all of it in a box over there. In fact, there's even more on top. Because when we do district goals, we look at this as, um, uh, for all of the goals, it, this is a very much of a team effort. We, we, we want a through line down to school improvement plans, down to individual goals. So we've been collecting the, the evidence over the last couple of months, and I really want to compliment Karen. She's done a terrific job of you know, working with all the principals and department chairs to to provide, you know, to provide some uh, really relevant um, insights through evidence of, of what the kind of work that's been going on this past year relative to these specific goals. So um, we still have a few things that even have come in just in the last day or so. So this box will be ready on Monday. You could even see it tomorrow, but it, we still have to put a few more things in. Sometime when you're up for um, a subcommittee meeting, if you wanted to look through this, to scan all of that would be huge. It would just be a huge amount of um, uh, information to put out electronically. You may find you don't like it this way, and we'll re re redo it you know, a different way next year. I just want to have some feedback on the process. So I'll give you a sort of a summary of all of this in terms of what to expect, but you should, you should have this all done out. It's very, I thought it was it's very clear in terms of each one of the goals and the evidence that's, that's there. Um, so I can give you some highlights, because I think really you know, we could talk about that. Just for clarification, the document that we were given uh, dated January 26, uh, 2017 from uh, CIA lists the evidence and things of that nature. Um, and that's what we all agreed on. So if, right. that, it's if in that's there. what's it's in, in there, that, that's, that's fine. That's what's in there. That's yeah, in the box. It's that's this. in the box. Right. It's I the mean, issue of how I mean, to get it to you, whether we were going to do well, it by scanning. I'm comfortable with coming in and going through it. Okay, that's fine, because that's what we thought would be best this year. I'm just curious, is it, when it comes down, example, it says professional practice goal, that said evidence, the physical design plan, uh, I guess, for the Gibbs uh, on it. Is it marked as evidence for professional practice goal? Great. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I'm fine with that, too. What we didn't have last year that I think would be helpful is a real narrative and sort of highlighting things. You know, we just had sort of a document dump. 
which in the document dump is helpful, but we didn't sort of have, you know, the report. <laughs> well, I gave you I gave you a report. I, I again we, we keep refining how I I, I did this send you a report electronically. You will send us one. No, I did last year too. Oh, oh yeah, but we. Um, I don't. I, I just felt that the report, sort of the highlights, the narrative was insufficient, and that's what I felt. So I'm going to try it a little bit different way this year. We'll see how this goes. Um, that might, and be good to get your feedback on it. There is just so much now. The one thing I will remind you about one of the goals had to do with the high school plan uh, for the educational plan that we need to submit to MSBA. We did the preliminary one which was a part of all the documentation that had to happen in module one. But what we discovered, if you recall, is that there was a process you had to go through the OPM in terms of time, then designer. In fact, I was going to give you an update on, on buildings tonight. So we are pro that whole goal has to be shifted to this year because that pro report won't be done until we, after we get the designer and we go through the next few months after that. So it's just, uh, there's a few that are, are like that that are going to be continued out. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll mention that in the highlights for each one. Okay. Kirstie, do you want it? I'm just pointing out there, I'm not real enthusiastic about this box approach. Mm. I interact with the documents. My work time is usually like 10 o'clock or later at night. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, when I say interact, I mean I highlight or I write comments on or, or any questions. I'm also concerned about our ability to refer back to something mm -hmm. and let everyone else know and then be able to find it, you know, because we're all like, are we all going to run into the box and then we shuffle, we hand it up and down? I understand there's a lot of documents. I'm, I can wait and see what your mm -hmm. report says because that may make a difference mm -hmm. in how, um, I feel about it because I did feel there wasn't a good connection last time between the evidence and what was being shown with the evidence, but I'm not a fan of the box so far. Bill? Uh, two things on process. Can we, can we go to that? Well, um, I'll wait. Yeah, why don't you wait on that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to share Kersey's uh, lack of enthusiasm for dealing with the box and having to physically be here to go through it, um, though I, I think that I'm willing to give anything a shot once. We, ne we never seem to be able to land on the perfect solution. No, it's, it's, it's hard. So, yeah. so you know, we'll, we'll, we'll play this way. Uh, I'll cry a little, and maybe, maybe at, at the conclusion of this process, we can figure out some summary way to have cover sheets or some, some way to have something electronic that we can work off of and have the depth of, of a bunch of stuff being in the box that we can refer to. I wonder, can I? Yeah, no. I wonder if, um, if you had, because you have the list of things that, that are, are listed in terms of deliverables. Mm -hmm. If there's anything in particular you want, we could scan it and put it in Novus. We could do that. It's just that we were looking at the at the how much there is mm -hmm. that it's just too much to put through that process um what we could do is is do maybe just you know the three but one of the three goals that you particularly wanted to look at was the high school mm -hmm. plan which has to be de delayed yeah. we could do the other two and just put those two through mm -hmm. all the evidence on that that could work. We talked about that at the beginning of the week, doing something like that. That yeah, that's an I, option yeah, too. There's there's no good answer to this because I, the other thing is I've got an inherent core belief that the work of the superintendent should be focused on teaching and learning in kids and not catering the school committee. So I don't want you spending a lot of time making this stuff happen or use an ex extraordinary amount of district personnel and resources. Uh, going through this when the, those resources are desperately needed to, elsewhere in the district. So I'm willing to go along and, and play and, 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 and figure out how to make this work and come up with suggestions for refining for next year. Uh, we, we, that's just what we have to do. All right. Let, 
Yeah. I'm just going on the process. Oh, you're on the pro okay, so. <clears throat> yeah, on the box. <laughs> oh, for the box. All right, all right, talk about the box. Okay, so right, you gotta yeah. think out of the oh. box. <laughs> so, so I do think I like the suggestion that we, at CIA came up with a list of evidence that we were looking for, mm -hmm. um, that we just focus on those, which mm -hmm. is a subset mm -hmm. of the box, I assume, mm -hmm. and that that gets sent to Novus that we can sort no, it of access the box. it. It is the box. Everything? But the design well, plan, I mean, there was, you, there was, well, you can give us a link for the design what plan. Say, is it, some, some of the items, like the design plan, Yeah. obviously you're not, if it's already, it's already out there on the internet, but obviously yeah, we, right. we don't need to scan that to Novus. Right. But some of the things, like the report about Maple, Right. Would be, I think, very, very interesting to all of us, yeah. okay. and have all of us have to come here and read it, you know. So I think with some discretion, you can think, well, this is just a summary. This is a list of all my meetings. I can scan that. There, there might be some short documents that you can provide. All right. Yeah. Either I think, Novus I think, or by email. I think there all should right, be. We'll, yeah. we'll take a look at that mm -hmm. tomorrow and. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Are we? Talking about, okay, so yeah, the, the process, we was talking about the process, so why don't we, since we jumped to the process, you were going to give a summary of where you were at, but. I will. Okay, you will after this. Okay, so the process is Karen and I are going to populate the evaluation tool. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk to you about this, but this we have to do. <laughs> so we're going <laughs> to populate the uh, evaluation tool. Um, you, you have a sample from last year, and then give it to everybody sometime next week, okay? <coughs> At some point in the middle of next week, I don't know when. And then you have until the week <coughs> of the final meeting of October, which is the 26th, 7th, 8th, whatever that is. Sure. 26th? 26th. 26th, October 26th, to <clears throat> get it back to Karen. Um, and then Karen and I will compile it into one document that, and then we report out as a committee on November 9th, I think it is. Yep. Um, that's the first meeting. Yep. And then the 16th to the second one, because then we have Thanksgiving. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's the ninth. Yeah. So yeah, and so that's that's the process. So we'll we will we'll populate that document. We'll make sure it's as as clear as it can be. Give it to everybody, and then you can start filling it out. Yeah. So question: We've done different things. Are we going to read sort of the total summary? You know. As the most important, are we going to read summaries for each section? I don't know. I haven't Let's thought about it. Anyway, to let us know because it will, mm. we'll fill it out differently depending. Well, on I mean, I think that so take a look and see how you, how you how you create the document. Well, it's the same document we've used. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, but you're just not going to do as much. If are you? you could give us guidance about what you're thinking, and then we can then yeah. sort of create our document based on what. I mean, I think that the, the practice in the past has been that there's a summary sheet that gives the average that that's already ready. There's everyone gets a chance to read their report or not. Um, you can decline, hmm. and that's really it. So you're basically reading the your summary. Own, yeah, the you're summary. reading your evaluation yeah. summary. Yeah, you're reading. Yeah, because then there's a subsections which sometimes we we focus Some on, and sometimes it's a choice. We I sort of I, I I would probably just give people the choice. Okay. That would be my style. That if you want to read the other subsections, great. but all at once. Yeah. yeah. Oh okay. yeah, it'll be all at once. Every, every member will get their okay. turn. We'll go great. Len. That's helpful. Yeah, we'll go yeah. right from. Great. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay, from one bald guy to the bottom of the other <laughs> bald guy. Sorry, Len. <laughs> Go ahead. I would ask that the document that you come up with be done in a Word document, not a PDF, so that we can interact with it. Oh, it'll be done in a Word document. Okay. Yeah. And the second thing, just for my sake and remind everybody, the consideration of what we're dealing with is from July 1st, 2016 through mm -hmm. June 30th, mm -hmm. 2000. Uh, 17. Correct. It's the last Anything that year. we've acquired between the past four, three months, and that's where it gets messy. Some of us do, some of us don't. So I'm just. Well, it could be about. evidence of what happened in the school of year course. that was delivered later, I, but the, test the evaluation course. period yes. is right. the school year. Right. That's right. The summer pro is last summer year. projects are not part of this deal. Mm -hmm. This year's. Last year's. Right. Part. Right. That's I mean, all. Thank you. Right. I mean, it's a fine line because some of the stuff is you're working on it all year and you finish it in the summer. <laughs> Dr. Boyd, you want to give another? So we've talked about the process. Do you want to give any overview? Do you want to? I think it's probably the best. I think they want it in writing, yeah. so yeah. we'll do it yeah. that okay. way. So okay. right. Superintendent's going to do a memo. We're going to get it uh, sometime next week. Hopefully, let's time it then. Let's time Kathy's yeah. memo with your, you and I putting together this uh, um, evaluation tool. We'll get it all out in one, one thing. <clears throat> All right. right. Now we're on to the superintendent's report. We already heard half of it. We talked about uh, the TAs. Now we're going to talk about building projects and other things. 
building projects. That's always on the, the agenda. Because we got none of those. <laughs> we have a lot of we building are. projects. <laughs> we do. We are full-time um, construction management people now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if a day goes by or I don't have some meeting on buildings. Really. And sometimes they're, like Monday, there'll be half the day on building projects. So at any rate, uh, but <coughs> the good news is the building projects are moving forward. The, the, the high school, we are in the process right now of um, selecting, well, collaborating with MSBA to select a designer for the high school. We went through a process where we, we um, solicited applications and we had six applications. Um, the firms who are all, all of these firms are very highly respected um, firms that probably could do the job and do it well. I'll tell you the names because it's not, it's public information. It, and these are in alphabetical order. Arrow Street, DRA, Feingold, Flansburg, HMFH, and Castle Bowes. Mm -hmm. So it's a process of doing research references and we will be, we will be having meetings with uh, MSBA this month. Um, they'll, and we, they have 13 people and we have three representatives that will go. Um, it's required that the superintendent, the town manager, and uh, the committee uh, has uh, voted for um, uh, our chair mm -hmm. to be with the third member. So that will be happening. In that process, we will have the, it'll, it'll start getting whittled down. And I don't know how many of these could be three, possibly four, maybe two. It's hard to say until we go through the process. We'll actually come and interview at MSBA uh, for this. So I, by the end of October at the latest, we should have uh, a designer selected. And then once that happens, then all these other things will begin happening in which uh, the next part of the feasibility uh, fe feasibility study. So that's a big <coughs> milestone, and then we'll be moving forward from that. And it will seem like we'll be going a little bit faster as we get, to, as we as that happens. So that's that's a good spot to be in. Um, the Gibbs Building is you heard, you saw some of it. Mm -hmm. It is in the dem it has been demo. Uh, we uh, walked by it the other day. It's like oh you can goodness. see straight through it. Yeah. 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 no windows. There's nothing, nothing. inside. I know. Nothing. I, like, I mean, wow. we're doing major. It's a major overhaul of that building. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's after they did an analysis, they just realized there's more things that need to be done. It's just. Um, but we but concurrently, what's going on with the building? We're working on. Uh, furniture and equipment. Mm -hmm. um, there's still more to be done in terms of design, interior design. So that's a mm -hmm. lot of that work was done last year with the Gibbs Advisory, um, and then we've been on furniture and equipment. That is all department share work, and that there's been significant amount of time spent on that um, over the last month and a half, uh, and will continue. In fact, if you go into my office. <laughs> tonight, it's actually quite funny. Um, I, they asked where all the samples would need to be delivered, mm. and they're delivered in my office. So there's, <laughs> there's all these desks and chairs, and you're welcome, I put <laughs> comment sheets on each piece. Looks like some kids got in detention. It looks like a detention room. <coughs> yeah, there's just all these chairs, and it's not only in the outer office, but it's in the inner office, and uh, so um, we're gonna, I've invited administrators tomorrow to come in and do the, you know, the seat test. <laughs> Um, so that is moving forward quite quite well. Uh, Hardy, that is also, as you know, that there's the, the sh there's been a shift in the time that the project will be completed. Mm -hmm. But I have to say there uh, there's going to be a presentation um, to the school council at Hardy uh, on Tuesday, and to just to show them where we are this at this point with designs. And I think that. Uh, you know, I will. Uh, I want to compliment the architects. They really thought of some very creative things, which we need to get them in here to to show you as well. Um, and I will try to set that up sometime in the next month or so, that she, so you can see some of the designs that 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 are going to ha happen. Um, and we'll talk about that when when they actually come. So um, Stratton is in the last stages 
uh, what we need to complete. We're at the punch list time. I think the big issue right now is getting that landscaping done and um, you know, the irrigation back in place. But that, that's, in, that's in very good shape. Thompson, um, well, I still don't have a date yet for mm -hmm. a temporary uh, CO. Uh, we, we probably won't even have the other one for a little bit longer. There are some, there's still some holdups um, with it, but compared to where, when I was talking to you two weeks ago about this, been major progress. It really is very close to having students be able to move into the classrooms. Um, but there are still some things that need to be, there's some issues that have come up, and in fact, there's been issues that come, have come up this week that may delay this a little bit longer, um, fortunately. But to Thompson's credit, um, they've been moving forward, and, uh, and today, um, <laughs> our assistant superintendent, Mr. McNeil was able to be, spend the day down there, um, and he would attest to the fact that all is going well. It's going very well. Mm -hmm. Very impressive staff. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I got a chance to meet uh, parents uh, during the arrival process, and also visit classrooms and see all the wonderful things that are going on, and also interact with the students, mm -hmm. which was uh, very joyful for me mm -hmm. as uh, I'm getting. As last year, I was a yeah. elementary principal, so I had to. He's been in with the draw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the kids are. Cute. That was my connection. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was a uh, it was a wonderful day. Yeah. Have a to do that. And, and we also have hired someone to do when we have more contractors in there to do security um, surveillance. So that feels a lot better too. Unfortunately, there's not been enough workers there <laughs> in the last couple of days to to warrant it, but. You know, it, it's going to be done, and 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 uh, Ruthie, Ben, and I, we, we meet at least once a week um, regularly on all of the capital and building issues. And the one thing that we were talking about this week is that when it is done, we do feel that it's going to be have been done well. Mm -hmm. So it will be. Um, we don't have any worries in that in that regard. <clears throat> so. Thompson's uh, like a P, when you ask a, stu a PhD student when, when she's going to finish, I said, well, that could be 2018, 2019, 2020. It's, like, uh, oh, it's a little frustrating. <laughs> don't, even, don't even use those <laughs> no. numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, then yeah. we're going to have to figure out actually what the move, how the move is going to occur. Yeah. Um, I mean, we don't have really uh, any um, vacations coming up on the horizon, and I certainly don't want to wait until vacation to be able to, to do this. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. We already have some ideas how that's going to happen. Yeah. So, um, Can I ask one thing? Yeah. Who's moving? Who's moving? Yeah. The ones that are which, which, which grades? Is there a, a pattern to this? Do, are we putting one classroom of each grade over there? Or, depends or on, it depends on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's going to be fifth grade classrooms on the top floor, mm -hmm. and I believe there's going to be some third grade in the second. So it's really trying to get the, the grades all in the same area. So who will physically have to move mm -hmm. are three fifth grade classrooms. Fifth grade is supportable. That's they, where they are now. Mm -hmm. they're, in the, they're, in the, they're in the portables. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we also in one art room. Yeah. So we're in an art in the cart right now. They're going to miss the portables, the fifth graders. No, they well, won't. Well, you, you know, they are a little bit. I'm sure they're not unhappy the fact that they've gone Our through condition. this heat wave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yes. Yes. laughs> yes. I've heard oh, yeah. that You're there's a little Cindy. nostalgia mm -hmm. for the portables this yeah. last week or two up at Stratton. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have so. six of them, and they're the only ones that have not been had classrooms of 95 degrees. Yes, mm -hmm. the classrooms have been so it's been hot, horrible. and this, humi this, this week was really tough because of the humidity. Mm -hmm. uh, we could beat Singapore if we had the air conditioning. <laughs> I just want to ask one quick question about Gibbs. Is there any way that we could get some of the samples over to Audison so kids could give input? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Put in the furniture? That would be On fun. On the furniture? The furniture. Yeah. Let the sixth graders try it out. Yeah, that's what, because I'm thinking Don't sixth give them the one with the wheels. Don't give them a lot of different sizes, and most of them are smaller than adults. So I can tell you the chair that we all want. It's the only one that's got wheels on it. Well, I want the wheelchair. Well, they come down to um, 
That's not a bad idea, actually. Let me think about that if we can get some input. Yeah, think, yeah if you could just bring them and, you know, even if the kids stay after school to sit and try and yeah, make we their have, comments. We are at a pretty tight time frame on yes. this, um, yeah. but let me see what we can do about that. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you for the idea. Um, the, only, the only other thing I, I just want to recognize. Excuse me, just one thing. Those aren't the ones that are going to be using it, though. Just be aware of that. They're the fifth graders that are going to yeah, use it. Yeah, but that's the yeah, prototype. The, the oh, sixth okay. graders sixth, are, are the eight. target audience. They right. become sixth graders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is your sixth graders. So if you want to f f find much. out the opinion of a sixth grader, you ask a sixth grader. Good luck. <laughs> Well, we have the smartest sixth graders in Massachusetts. You think? All right. Um, I want to thank and uh, recognize the jazz band and the Madrigal Singers for their spectacular performance at Town Day. Um, yes, I agree. They were great, and a good, a good number, if not close to half, of the jazz band are ninth graders. And so they only had a couple of weeks to practice, and they did. They were just they were amazingly, amazingly good. So, want to recognize them, and I also want to uh, recognize the high school for undertaking this very creative art unification project. It's just unfortunate that we got deluged with rain that collapsed it. I think hmm. the the students were disappointed, but somebody made a, a very um, interesting m metaphor. But I said, well. The thing that happened is that the poles came down, the structure, but the web held together. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a lovely idea, because it did. It did hold together. So that's my report. All right, thank you very much. We're going to move on to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of minutes, school committee regular meeting, September 14, 2017. Approval of warrant uh, number 18054, total amount $627,000, <coughs> dated September 14, 2017. We have a motion. Mm. Motion by second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Okay, vote delegate and resolutions for the MSC annual business meeting. Um, <clears throat> the meeting uh, will be held on Wednesday, November 1st at 3.15 p.m. We uh, send a delegate to that meeting. Uh, <clears throat> and who is going to be attending? We I, I will attend. I mean, if anybody else is attending, they're welcome to be the delegate. You know. Right, so why don't we... It, I nominate Mr. Schlickman as our delegate. <laughs> second, the, uh, may I have a second, please? Aye. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? It carries unanimously. So, Wait. Paul, can you bring, like, bring the motions to us? Yeah, yeah, they're, 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 pu they're published. I can, uh, <clears throat> we, we can get it to you and you can offer opinions. So we should Excellent. run the next agenda? Oh, sure. we can put, yeah, the, the, the resolutions. So MA, MASC <laughs> resolution. No, we should Sarah, discuss I them here. That. I didn't. Mm. Well, no, we, we, we want to talk about them so that if the committee has an opinion, but do you want to like talk about them now? Do reflected you want to? No, by the no, well, no, no. no. Oh, okay. Look at the time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we're not going to talk about them now. Okay. We'll talk about them next mm -hmm. week, and maybe devote 15 minutes of the meeting to it. People mm -hmm. read them in advance. Mm -hmm. If anyone has any opinion, the the delegate, if I remember, the, if I recall, the rules can vote however he wishes. He doesn't have to listen to the committee's mm -hmm. advice. Mm -hmm. You're not he, bound by what the committee votes. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't, he doesn't come back here, though. Well, okay. <laughs> but I mean, so, yeah, right. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> you might not vote for me to delegate next year. You're right. Okay, okay so. True. Okay, uh, committee reports. We're going to uh, budget. Okay, budget. Um, so draft budget. We met um, on Tuesday. Uh, the draft budget calendar is coming, probably our next meeting. Monthly reports. We had a discussion about what we'd like to see. We're going. We um, talked with Mr. Dent Denizio, and he's going to do kind of a first draft for us, and then we're going to do feedback and and work towards perfection that way. Um, the budget book. We started some discussions. We're hoping to see changes this year with the aim of improving usability, engagement, and and um, we're going to continue that discussion in future meetings. Um, outreach. We're going to do what we did last year, and our next meeting is on the 17th at 5:30. Very good. Thank you. Cool. Community relations. Kind of. Um, well, uh, 
as you know, we uh, did our um, HRC, uh, but we also came up with the final mm -hmm. plan for the school committee office hours. So here's what I've done. I have created one. All of the signs are in here. So all you have to do is take off the top <coughs> one, and then the next one is on there. So oh. we just pass it around. And look what's on the back. Uh, who's the got schedule. What? Look at that. It's updated. Look at that. that. Tells you where to go, <laughs> when you have to be there, who's going to be there. So the first two are Paul and Jennifer. Yep. Mm. That's the sign. I'll take it. There you go. So then we can just pass the sign <laughs> to the next group. If we do anything outreach to the community, the cafe has two us. Oh, yeah. Cafe Nero. Cafe has yeah. They made it. Cafe. They, they made it unique. Cafe. Don't ask cafe me. Nero? I'm just in the word cafe. In the word cafe. Mm. It's spelled with two L's. Don't ask me. <laughs> Not I didn't anywhere do it. else. No, no. It's, yeah, they, it's it a proper name. Okay, okay, all right. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Very good. Great. That's Thanks. it. Oh. We don't Thank have another meeting planned. CIAA. We will be meeting at 5:30 p.m. on October 10th. And the, and the agenda items will be um, obviously we've got some correspondence that yep. uh, uh, we want to talk to the folks about the gifted uh, yep. uh, who, who were before us and uh, Mr. Hainer's got a motion I may, and I apologize I emailed it to you earlier tonight I didn't get it printed out I move that the issues mentioned in the email from Kathleen Roach dated September 19th and from Colette Lamontania I hope I pronounced it right dated uh, September 19th also be referred to CIAA for discussion and if appropriate to make recommendations to the full committee as soon as possible. Put those on the agenda for that night. Okay, may I have a second? Second. 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 Any discussion? I don't know why yes. we need a motion. Uh, I believe the second email was about the, the kindergarten TAs. Uh, both of, that's what are, what are no. the topics of them? Are they both about TAs in kindergarten? No, no, no. they're not. Gifted in curriculum. Oh, right. No, one is a curriculum question right. raised about the curriculum topic. Oh, the health. Yes. Health. Uh, so yeah. it's teaching. It's, and the reason I made a motion is that's how, what I was directed to do. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, the subcommittee can talk about it. I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure to what extent we can really delve into right. the curriculum taught by a classroom teacher. Right. But... I mean, our job is to listen to people. That's so we're, I think we're going to listen well, to the parents. Let's do it then. We're going to listen to the parents that raise the issue. Right. And then uh, our, our authority may be limited by law. Mm -hmm. All right. Any? Okay, so there was a motion, a second. Any more discussion? Well, I, ha I have their email from Ms. LaMontagne. It is about Pierce Kindergarten aides. So mm -hmm. I mean, we can refer yeah. it and mm -hmm. ignore it. That's mm -hmm. fine. So. Okay, but that, then the second one is about... The one one is about the curriculum issue on health. Curriculum and the, the health care, yes. yeah, health care. Right. Uh, not the health care, the uh, health. Health, the teaching, how health we're teaching, teaching yeah. health. Both, yeah. both emails, the, 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 the people were told that it needed to go to CIA. Yep, yeah, right, that's mm -hmm. where it can be discussed. Mm -hmm. But we're not bringing a classroom teacher in to talk about our curriculum. No, 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 we're no. not doing that. Superintendent. We can bring the assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction. Okay. Right. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, it passes. So, did you, I don't even know if this works for Rod. Do you want to? We should probably check the time. It's October 10th. October 10th at October 10th, uh, 5 30. No, 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 not tonight. October 10th oh. at, at October 10th? Mm -hmm. At 5 30 yeah. a Tuesday. Okay. Does that work for you? Of we can course. adjust. <laughs> 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 well, check your. I mean, I don't want to. Okay. So I'll check my calendar. Yeah, if yeah. it doesn't, I think you need to if be. If it doesn't, there. we can make an adjustment. Right. Make an adjustment, yeah, because you Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, facilities, there's really... Uh, nothing, but I will be planning a meeting okay. at some point in the next Very good. couple weeks. Policies and procedures, Lynn? Yeah, still working on planning meeting. Uh, school enrollment task force, there's Has really nothing. Met? Legal S services review committee, Lynn and uh, Bill? We're waiting uh, on uh, some legal expenses, to, and then we'll set a meeting date. Okay. Arlington High School Building Committee, we've already talked about that. The Gibbs Committee? Nothing. Warrant Committee. Everybody got paid. That's always good. Mm -hmm. Any liaison reports? Any announcements? Arlington Youth Health Safety. You got the whole report from them. Mm -hmm. So it was an impressive report. <laughs> They're very, very nicely done. It was impressive. Um, yes. I guess I don't know if it's liaison or what, but I just wanted to point out to people that email that Rod, Ron, Rob sent us earlier today about the Building Bridges Conference. I yes. thought it looks really interesting. I want to try and go. 
Okay. It's on the 18th, um, if anyone else wants oh, to yes. go and carpool. I'm interested in going. Um, Dr. Bodhi was checking to see yeah. if we're covered under the member. Even if you're not, you know, I think yeah. it's really worthwhile going. Yeah, I the, said the, the membership covers three, the three people going for the membership dues, but we can send more people. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many it's more people, but um, we can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, diversity. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look good. yeah, I'm interested. The diversity I wish group, I yeah. Good. Wish I could get the time. Well, I'm bringing it up to tomorrow at the this. administrative meeting, so there'll probably mm -hmm. be some people from the administration. We'll have to find out how many people can go. Yeah. I didn't know there was a limit. Well, I mean, there's not a limit. There's only a limit in how much it's a, there's a fee, how much we want to spend, yeah. As long as we pay, we'll, they'll let us in. Great. We'll let you guys. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Bill. Any ad uh, announcements? Any future agenda items you want on the agenda? Yeah. Um, I'd love to see something, and maybe this happens months from now, um, sort of an update on the bring your own device um, rollout. You know, how it's, mm -hmm. what, you know, what's changed since last year? What are we doing? That kind of thing. Uh, All right. So to modify that, that to yeah. include the one-to-one -one trials that are going on. I know there's a new one at Dallin that we haven't been briefed on, so. Okay, so that'll be a report at some point. You have to figure out your schedules and see when you have something ready. Doesn't have to be, yep. Yep. What could, talk about this? What about the down, about the down? What is it? So the, just oh. the various one-to-one -one, oh, yeah, yeah. uh, one programs players. that are going on. There's a trial at, da at oh, Dallin. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Cindy, you, you I want to I talk about this, the compensation thing and mm -hmm. what we're going to do oh, about yeah. it and yep. how we get mm -hmm. feedback to whoever and why some things weren't covered and et cetera. Okay. Can, should that wander to budget first? Well, should, yeah. Yeah. for us to discuss it, should it might be considered executive session? <coughs> mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, I think it's yeah, an executive, executive session. Well, some of it, mm -hmm. some of what you want to talk about. But you're talking the about the missing a, parts. I don't oh, think we part. have to talk about yeah. an executive session. I just oh, oh, no, I don't no. know who do we send questions and oh, if you concerns. Have any questions, and I think the questions about that report. Send it to who it was the town manager's office that did that. Yeah, uh, or yeah. HR director. So why don't you send it to, to, yes. to Kathy and Karen, and they could forward it to Adam, and then it comes from the school committee through them to Adam, and then we'll get a okay. response. Actually, Dr. Brody can talk about some of the like things that are missing. Right, there's been some discussion back and forth. You mean your question about longevity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to try was, to get that information. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're yeah. going. We're, so I, I'm putting together to a spreadsheet of town manager 12, yeah. teachers, contract longevity amounts. Oh, okay, cool. I, I'll, I'll have that. I just yeah. thought it was weird that it wasn't in here. You know, I think it was probably my oversight that I didn't explicitly tell them mm -hmm. when they were doing the updated survey to definitely include that. They had right. all the contracts, but... Uh, they were looking mostly at the salary schedules. Right, uh, I know, but it, it be, in the beginning, it sounded like they were gonna they were gonna try to like not only compare people's salaries, but kind of what the benefits package was worth. Mm -hmm. And then they're we never looking, got that. Know, there was really like, nothing about that. And so you know that's that was really what I was looking for. I mean, any we can all do the salary. Mm -hmm. All this is public information. That's not the hard part. The hard part is digging in and like how much is our benefits package worth in total versus the town manager 12 right like because we always say well we have good this and we have good that and we have good this other thing and those should count but then that wasn't counted so I, th I think that's just kind of like oh yeah okay well that does require like a deeper dive <laughs> yeah into every contract and in, in terms of things that we might cover um some tuition reimbursements that other right. towns exactly. don't, and they might cover things that we don't. So it's, you know, you have to look at everything pretty closely. Right, which is why I thought we paid them the money yeah. to do it, so. But longevity was covered under <coughs> other, uh, groups in the town. Uh, yeah, and there's some town okay. groups. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I know yeah, you mentioned it, Dr. Bordy, but uh, the additional reports on civil rights and English uh, learner education, is that gonna be the next meeting or the meeting after that? First meeting in October. The first meeting in October. in October. Thank you. Yes. All right, folks. We're we're available in October. I am available on October 10th. All right. <coughs> meeting is on. Um, meeting of the men. You're welcome to come. I don't care. I'm not on that committee. Yet. You, 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 you can come, come with us. We like you. Cindy, never stop me. Yeah, that's unusual. <laughs>
Brick and painted with all men. Uh, okay, <laughs> we're gonna. I'm gonna entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. <laughs> Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 That carries unanimously. Whack that gavel. Okay, then we're all done. Okay. <laughs>